Well, hey everybody, Torque fans, thank you guys so much for uh, jumping in. We're going to start this off with what we thought would be a fun uh, Halloween-inspired event. We've got uh, some people that have uh, worked on various Torg books before in our fabulous you know, Halloween finery. <laughs> and your job out there is going to be to try and pick out who's who you know, of the uh, famous Torg authors. Uh, when I say famous, there's big quotes around that. Uh, <laughs> yeah. you want to be infamous for some of it. <laughs> right? <laughs> Some of us are going to be easy. Some of us are not going to be as easy because we haven't been on video as much, but there are names that you've seen inside the covers of books. Uh, we're asking people one guess only. Uh, so make your, your one shot count. And uh, when you're right, you know, someone off screen is going to tell us, you know, that, that, that you got us right. We'll reveal ourselves. And there are prizes. We've got uh, acrylic tokens, I believe, are the prizes for this one. And uh, we'll uh, we'll let you pick from a list. We'll 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 get in communication about that. Does that sound right? Okay, I'm, I'm seeing a, a nod off screen. <laughs> 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 All right. <laughs> So we want to uh, take a minute and let's introduce uh, our uh, our characters, our cast here. <laughs> At least you know our in disguise cast. So I'm the uh, the demon in a bottle. Uh, you, you the, those of you that are familiar with the storyline. Hmm. Hmm. You know, and I'm the shroud from uh, Torg Eternity, Isle Empire. <laughs> That's an awesome shroud outfit, by the way. That's yeah. very good. Well, it was real quick, <laughs> right? <laughs> I am a dark yeah. shadow. Definitely, our like our spookiest oh, outfit. Oh. <laughs> yes, very much so. Well, in fact, and I should, I should be, to be fair, Casey Jones, I, I, I lied to you guys. Casey Jones is not a regular Torg author. Casey Jones is an author from one of our other Ulysses lines. However, Ugh. he's been on a lot more podcasts and stuff, so hopefully we'll be a little easier to recognize. For <laughs> yep, yep. And the guess who? You want to introduce yourself? Oh, sorry. Yeah, I guess you could. I guess you could name me he who waits upon Amazon. Yeah. <laughs> All of us. Yeah. So, um. While we're getting started and while people are coming in, we're going to be doing some Torg trivia as we go off and on. Uh, there's a, you know, the people that guessed that are also going to be getting acrylic tokens. If you haven't seen it, look on our Facebook. We were doing a, a costume contest there. I don't know if we've announced what the prize for that is. So I'll, I'll take a minute and tell you guys, because I think it's pretty freaking cool, right? So we did a prototype if you've ever seen All Rolled Up, which are the same people that do the dice trays for us, and it's a, a similar material, and they've got a lot of pockets for your dice, your pencils, your tokens, and your things like that. And it's built, <clears throat> you roll it up into, you know, just kind of a, a cylinder, and it's got all your stuff there to go, and it's got art on it. And uh, it was something that we were thinking about doing for Cyber Papacy, but it didn't come together. So this is a one-of-a-kind prototype. As far as I know, it's the one and only. That's the prize for like coolest content, you know, costume. We'll be, you know, taking a look at those photos, you know, as we go through this, and we'll we'll announce the winner probably on Facebook. So, man, put your costume up there, everyone. It's totally worth a shot. It should be very fun, and it's a very cool prize. So, so, Demon, not to derail things, but when you say all your stuff, you mean like the dice, the chips? I mean, what all can it hold when you roll it up? 
Uh, so the pockets are various size. It's mostly meant for dice pins and tokens, but you know, nice. anything you can cram in there. <laughs> <laughs> gotcha. Oh, that sounds really awesome. Yeah. I didn't think this costume through. Yeah, I was thinking the same thing when I was about to grab my drink. It's like, uh, yeah, that's not going to work. <laughs> <laughs> um, so after we do this this guessing game in a couple of minutes, we'll actually start a panel on horror in general. This will be kind of a cross platform. You know, there will be some tour tips, but it's it's you know in the spirit of the holiday, we'll be talking about you know running horror games in general. After that, we'll get to the nitty gritty and talk about what people I think are been waiting for is our announcements around Orosh. And we'll give you some dates and we'll talk about what we're working on and how all that's going. treaters let's get ready for the horror panel i hope you had your guesses in uh, if you whispered your dev guesses to uh uh eric in chat or myself we'll collect your guesses and make sure that you guess them right at this point though i, I did copy and paste all guesses into a word document um uh, hashtag not sponsored by microsoft uh but let's get uh live with our horror panel um with bill bridges eric simon Daryl Hayhurst and Greg Gordon. Uh, I'm about to take their microphones live and we'll be ready for the panel. Um, if you have questions, uh, shoot them uh, my way in chat and I'm going to speak them to the panelists so that they can answer them during our show. So without further ado, I'm going to turn uh, this back over to our uh, honorary demon in the bottle for the evening, uh, Daryl Hayhurst. So does this mean I can like take this mask off? Is that what that says? <laughs> You know, I was thinking it might be an improvement with it on, but I think we need your face for the rest of the time. No. <laughs> oh, <laughs> I'm, I'm never going to get invited back. They're like, ah, oh, who was that a hole? No, no. Grand no it's, uh... <laughs> yeah, no, we, we totally need you, man. <laughs> Thank goodness, because like, there's a little bit of weight on this thing and on my glasses. It was killing me. And I also can't drink my prop, you know, when I've got it on. <laughs> <laughs> Hopefully that was an easy spot. Like I moved my camera a little bit, you know, and I'll move it back, you know, actually while we're talking, uh, just to mix things up enough to hopefully confuse viewers for five seconds, you know, or so. So um, I had a question for the panelists right off the bat. Uh, we can decide uh, how Torg related uh, this is and uh, horror related it is. Um, so the question here. And we'll make sure that it's a good faith question, um, non-controversial. So there's a question uh, that comes with, what was the deal with Jeff Mills in the Five Realms RPG in O-Torg? Uh, did Graham, Greg just randomly want to do a self-insert, or did he have other plot reasons for that arc? There were reasons. No. <laughs> uh, the, the, that was not, I did not create that uh, plot line. <laughs> so... <laughs> I have I have an idea what they were trying to go with that, but that was uh, that was Ed Stark, uh, Doug Kaufman, and um, then it got handed off to Greg Farsty. So there was supposed to be I, without getting you know spoilerific, 
I think his role was supposed to be what Quinn Sebastian is uh, doing a little bit in uh, Turg Eternity. So there you have it, Gamer X Twenty Seven, and I, I'm going to ask you to know. I'm, I'm going to kind of moderate you out there in the crowd. Be kind to the devs; they're dedicating their time here on Halloween um, to come out here and answer some wonderful questions about horror and tabletop. It's all right. We like it rough. speak for yourself (laughs) so and the other thing that we should say like anyone that's out there watching there's a a a digital prize you know it's trick or treat right it's Halloween if you come here you knock on our digital door which is whisper uh, Eric you know uh, in in the window whisper Torg or treat to him we're going to give you a link to a download it's pretty cool we think it's the the first five uh, monsters from the threat cards for the upcoming crowdfunding that we haven't even announced yet. So this is like a pre, 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 preview. And the gaunt man is himself is one of them. So Torb yeah, or I treat. Through, I was scrolling through them as I was setting that up and I was like, oh, oh, we just got that right in there. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> So, Everyone knows I don't like to hold back. <laughs> like if we're doing this, do we're not. Doing <laughs> so we had a question come out from the uh, audience uh, as well, and this question is regarding the new Orosh material. Uh, Cyber Papacy did an excellent job integrating new tech into the setting. Do you have any plans to do the same with Orosh and modern horror regarding creepy pastas and tulip monsters like uh, Slenderman or Candle Cove? I'm going to defer that question when we're talking about Orosh directly. But All right. I will answer that question, but not yet. You know, when we're talking yeah. more like how we're going to do a Rorsch and things like that, absolutely stay tuned. Uh, you know, this one, and we might want to warm up with some, you know, like uh, a, like a general, like, hey, when I'm running horror, like this is a this is how I attack it. And so we've got Bill Bridges here, we've got Greg, you know, we've got Lehman, you know, and we've got John, like. Let's attack this, right? Like so, yeah. And I, I actually have a question for the panelists. So, uh, dabbling in design and uh, the facilitation of games myself, um, how have you? Uh, what do you think the biggest uh, evolution in horror as it's presented tabletops has been? And like, say, maybe the maybe the past decade, or have you noticed one? Uh, and I, I'd like each panelist to to give their perspective on this, uh, going across as we see them in the overlay from. Bill, then Eric, then Daryl, then Greg. Oh, geez. Evolution in the last 10 years. I, you know, I don't know. I'm not sure what's really happened uh, big time in at least role-playing games for horror in the last 10 years. Somebody remind me if I'm missing something. Well, I've got one. Like, I'll jump for, I'll, like, I'll, I'll jump the line so I can do yeah, this one and steal it. So, like, I like, you know, when you talk about, like, like games and one of the, the like internal talk we like to do is we call it technology, right? Well, it's not really technology. It's just dice tricks and whatever. But I thought the coolest piece of technology for horror games to come out in the last 10 years was the Jenga Tower oh, for Dread. Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Fantastic idea, right? For some reason, I was thinking that it's older than 10 years. but uh, I mean, years. it could be, in which case you guys can fire me later, but I'm going with it, right? Jenga Tower all the way. You know? no, it's brilliant. And, yeah, it, it is because it's all about ratcheting up that tension. And you can do that with dice, but I think it's even cooler when you know with, with the Jenga Tower. And I think it, it it got people out of the box and thinking about approaching horror and dread in a different way. So that's my answer. Yeah. That was a good one. Yeah. <laughs> I would I would nominate I would nominate Alien and Aliens for the stress mechanic. Uh, um, I thought that was a really good way of uh, of making players suffer the same sort of experiences without having to make the uh, dumb decision that movie characters make by just sort of simulating the you know the the bad choices you end up with. So I'd say the the real arc has been that mechanical support for the narrative of horror. I mean, Cthulhu set the bar, and it 
it drifted for a little bit. And I'd say in the last 10 years, they've really nailed it. They have gone. There are a lot of games out there that are just creepy to play. Um, what's the one with the, the oh, I can't remember the one with the candles. Ten candles. Where yeah. Yeah, yeah. It's where your life is represented <laughs> by the candles and they get snuffed out and the room gets darker. <laughs> it's like, yeah. oh, that's excellent. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, so for me, the the physical tricks, um, the the Jenga tower, the candles, are interesting, but they don't engage me personally. Um, I this is I have a long rant about this that it's because I'm a Meisnerian actor, not a Stanislavskian actor. Um, but that's uh, that's an entirely different set of geekiness. Um, I don't know. We got 35 minutes to fill, so go ahead and rant. <laughs> Uh, I was going to say, I'm so, trained two so degrees for, from Stanislavski, so this is very interesting to me. Go on. <laughs> yeah. Um, so uh, so for, for me, actually, one of the most uh, excellent recent things has been uh, actually just the reconsideration of um, Cthulhu and the mythos and uh, the, the interaction with Lovecraft as a person and as a fandom fandom um the you know the the things that i'm thinking about specifically are harlem unbound um and uh fate of cthulhu uh and and one of the things i really appreciate about uh fate of cthulhu uh for instance is they also use stress instead of sanity and personally i feel uncomfortable about games that use sanity mechanics um and try not to play them um and that is you know because of my own personal backgrounds and that's uh, that sort of thing but um but yeah so so i really appreciate kind of that rethinking of um you know how we even approach the the core horror so I want to toss this back to Bill because we kind of talked about, you know, the time frame is kind of hard uh, to, to deal with when we talk about, say, just 10 years. What would you say, a, um, and we've hinted at, at, at some of the mechanics or technology, uh, to, to borrow a phrase from Daryl, what are some uh, of what you would refer to as maybe the more classic uh, game design techniques to use in horror as a genre as presented in a tabletop game? Mm. Well, I mean, in terms of techniques, I mean, what's what uh, Eric just mentioned, Call of Cthulhu kind of started off the whole idea of thinking uh, outside of the box on that. And uh, with its sanding mechanic and, you know, we go into stress and stuff. But, uh, I mean, it's really just, it's all, there's an evolution in the way people see these games more than the mechanics. You know, when the World of Darkness hit, it's where you all of a sudden started playing the monster rather than just running around being scared by it. Even though that, of course, lent itself to a lot of power gaming stuff also to where you were more superhero than monster sometimes, uh, which lost some of the horror elements. But, uh, you know, at different iterations of the World of Darkness tried to bring that back to... And uh, other games uh, dealing with horror, bringing it more like, you know, called Cthulhu traditionally in the 30s. But then you've got, uh, 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 what was the uh, Delta Green and stuff, who were bringing it more into modern stuff. And that, I think, helped situate and broaden the way everybody looked at the mythos. It wasn't just some antique little thing that was out of Lovecraft's mind. It could have been going on all sorts of the modern world. And I think that's where you're really growing is just in the context, uh, as Eric mentioned, with uh, Harlem Unbound. And that was starting to happen in literature with The Ballad of Black Tom by Victor Laval and Lovecraft Country recently on, you know, popularized in HBO, but it was based off a novel. So the broadening people who aren't traditionally associated with horror being able to come into the field and into the genre. And that's, we're seeing that more in the role-playing games now too. And it's going to be really interesting to see where all that goes because uh, there's lots of uh, ways you can twist what has traditionally been seen as horrible, but it's more horrible from some perspectives and you know, there's whole sorts of levels we haven't even explored on this sort of stuff yet. And I'm nattering on. Somebody no, 
Oh, sure. so got 30 minutes, matter away. <laughs> In fact, uh, yeah, I, I, it. I actually clipped that, and I'm just going to play that on loop for the next 30 minutes. And we'll see how <laughs> how I'm kidding. So um, what do you think the biggest challenge is, or what are the barriers to running a successful horror tabletop RPG? And I'd first like to hear from Daryl, then I would like to hear um, from Eric, and then anyone else can jump in or give a counterpoint or a different perspective. Yeah. So, like, I think number one, the most difficult barrier, you know, to cross is mostly when you're playing a tabletop game, you're engaging in a fantasy, right? And sometimes it's a power fantasy, but you, you, you're always, you have a measure of control. And in able to get horror you have to have lost control. And that can be very difficult to take away from players and still have an entertaining, engaging story, right? It's like, well, first you got to get them to care, and now you got to essentially punish them at the tabletop, you know, and take away their control and make them feel things that they maybe didn't want to feel. That's incredibly challenging. And maintaining that balance and that tone and keeping it going in a way that's going to be pleasurable, like watching a horror movie can be pleasurable, insanely difficult. Yeah, I uh, I was just looking at the, the question uh, that uh, Dalip, Dali P, I'm, I'm actually not sure how, how to pronounce that, but um, had, uh, because the, the trick with horror is that to tell a horror story, everybody has to have buy-in. Um, there are other games that you can run where you don't need as as much kind of coherence in terms of tone. Um, but with a, when you're really telling a horror story collaboratively, like the buy-in has to be extremely high. Uh, people really have to agree that this is what we're here to do. And the thing that I will say about games like Dread or um, uh, or Ten Candles or uh, the the wonderful tiny game uh, that was based on um, actual cannibal Shia LaBeouf, um, <laughs> <laughs> uh, the those. They're designed to maximize the the commitment to the bit. Really, is is then that's what it is. It's about commitment to the bit. Um, so I I feel like when you're doing a, a scary story, a horror story, um, you know I I think it's always uh, valuable to have a chat with people beforehand, uh, with your players, especially when you're sitting down with strangers. Um, at a convention or something to say, you know, this is the kind of game that we're going to have right now. Um, but also to ask them, hey, you signed up for a horror game. What is it you're looking for? Um, you know, are you looking to be terrified? Are you looking to uh, be the survivors? Um, or, or maybe do you all want to die except for one of you uh, and you want me to decide who that is? You know, that sort of thing. Um, those are the the kinds of things that, that you want to ask as you're going in because uh, people have different expectations for, for horror. Um, <laughs> and, and, I, and I want to add in, like, Shane Hensley is one of the best at this and he has set an impossibly high bar He's actually made a player pee a little at the table. They got scared so bad. Jeez, wow. I have never achieved that. I've never even come close. Life goals. Just <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, I mean, part of the issues are that gamers are so heavily versed in all the genre tropes. They've seen it all before. They've experienced it on TV movies. They're well studied on it. How do you surprise players anymore and you know, vice versa? How does players surprise you anymore, really? And so it gets tough. And so a lot of times, like with you know, vampire other games and stuff, try to go more on the personal end of like if you imagine John Carpenter's the thing, you can play it where it, the creature is sure it's horrible, but everybody knows what it is. So it's the more the horror is, 
how far are you willing to go to hurt your friends to determine whether they are or are not the creature? And so it becomes those sorts of levels, I think. Dead. Yeah, I think uh, purple is sus. Uh, <laughs> sorry, that's a current pop culture reference for those of you. <laughs> I am neither current nor cultured, so it flew over my head. <laughs> so we Among have Us a is a social deduction game that's basically the thing. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so we have a uh, another question from chat. Um, this is uh, this is a question about facilitating games, and uh, they've mentioned that horror games work well in an intimate setting. But is there any tips for running a horror game for a large group? Um, anyone can answer. I mean, there's always the zombie apocalypse stuff. Those happen on very large levels, citywide, so on. So it's more of an issue of, you know, get out, get away kind of things. And can you work together to do it? Or are you going to be turning on each other to do it and stuff? And you're constantly meeting with other survivors. Are they friends, enemies, allies, whatever, those, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So uh, I think setting it in a large horror setting might help. The more intimate ones are a little tougher on that level. Yeah, the only large... Large scale horror that has really worked for me are LARPs. Because those, you gain back some of the element of surprise simply because you don't know who all those other people are. And so you can ratchet up suspense and stuff a lot more easily. But just straight tabletop, it's hard. I think the largest horror game I've run is 12 people, and that was not smooth. <laughs> So, yeah, God, it's gonna be rough. General, general question for the group, and uh, I'm hearing a bit of an echo come through someone's speakers. I think that's Bill. It might be yeah. Bill. Um, Not to point any fingers, Bill. Bill. Me. I, I, actually, it's part of the horror trope. I'm hearing, I'm hearing uh, the ghost within my own mind. Uh, the question after I ask, <laughs> getting me to second guess every word that I speak on this live broadcast. And thank you all for coming out. By the way, we've got over two dozen viewers. There'll be many more that watch this on YouTube and on demand. Um, Those of you just joining us, whisper Torg or treat to Eric to get your digital prize. Your cool treat. It's not a trick, I promise. If there was an ideal outcome in a horror game, um, just describing it in your own words, uh, I'm curious to hear from you developers. What would it be ideally? You know, and uh, give an example. I, <laughs> there's the Shane Hensley. I want a player to pee their pants. And I want Daryl <laughs> to learn about this. And I want it to be mentioned on a global broadcast internationally by a major tabletop publisher. Oh, and <laughs> oh he would be proud to have that go out. <laughs> like, that's a bad No, honor. no, I get that. More. I get that. that I a... suspect the player does not want that to go out. <laughs> no, it, when the, and their name's withheld. It was me. It wasn't me. It but, was um, me. <laughs> <laughs> but, um... Yeah, so I, I'm curious to hear from, from each of the devs. Um, and uh, we can go in reverse order. We'll go Greg, Daryl, Eric, then Bill. <laughs> Our victory um, condition. Yeah, yeah, yeah it's just... When running? Because I, I can't set the goal without the players because I've, I've only run a horror campaign as opposed to a one-shot, mm -hmm. I think, four times. And each time the players had very different tolerances. You know, some really wanted it to be, you know, cold check night slayer monster of the week. They basically are going to win. So it wasn't so much a horror campaign. So I'd say a true horror campaign. I've only run one. It's hard. You can't push the players beyond where they want to go. And so and a lot of people will sign up for more than they actually want to do. So you have to, you have to backpedal. And that's that's hard to keep a campaign continuity once two or three players go, uh, nah, nah, <laughs> <laughs> can't can't go there. So I don't yeah. have good advice for for running horror without really knowing your players. Which is also good advice in and of itself. Get to know the players. Yeah. yeah. And yeah, and this is not like an advice thing. This is like a victory condition. This is what I go for or what I would hope for in a horror scenario. 
if there are zero to one survivors, but everyone loved it, that is perfect as far as I'm concerned. Like, like that's that's crossing the finish line and going, yes, you know, <laughs> zero to one survivors, but everyone still had fun. Boom, we're there. We're in the zone. You know. All right. So I'll I'll ask a counter question then. So is that zero to one survivors over the length of the campaign or the length of a session? Well, so I tend like I tend to run horror in shorter blocks, right? Like okay. <laughs> because as noted, like I'm brutal about it, right? Like I feel like that's a component of it. It's got to be dangerous. And if we've got time at the end, I'll talk about like an alternate way that I run where I can have my cake and eat it too. But yeah. <laughs> yeah, I I find that going beyond six sessions is almost impossible for well, me because I, if I'm getting character turnover, the buy-in is decreasing and uh, they start becoming like that. I've forgotten which was it the guild where the guy has 50 bards. Yeah. Yeah. After a while, <laughs> horror games, which have a high body count and a campaign start for me, at yeah. least start becoming that where they just go up oh, next one up. You so, know. so and well, the, the thing that I kind of wanted to do, you know, and this has always been my, my notion for an extended horror campaign is every episode's got two parts. And the first part's like short. It's like 30 minutes, an hour or whatever. And you're playing, if it was Torg, they'd be Ords. In Savage Worlds, they'd be Extras or whatever. But you've kind of got your pregen and you're put in the situation and you are going to get murdered, right? Like the monster of the week or whatever it is that you're dealing with is just going to pick them off one by one by one, you know? And what matters is the last survivor and how far they get, right? And then your heroes, you know, the, the Storm Knights or the wild cards or whatever in the system, they come into that situation. And the two things that have happened there is, one, you've set up the threat, right? Like, oh, cool, the monster, we've seen it devour someone. We know how bad that is. And I don't have to murder a player character <laughs> to get that feeling, to get that threat for it, you know. And B... They care, like, oh, can we find that one, that last person? Did they make it? You know, where are they? Can we get them? Can we rescue them? You know, and, like, it's got those two pieces. I've yet to pull this structure off, but I feel like that's the way to have your cake and eat it, too, is a little two-part thing. Oh, you, you, you've stolen the intro to my, my encounter today. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't know. I'm sorry. <laughs> no, nah, we're fine. Not really. <laughs> Stay <laughs> tuned, everyone. <laughs> but a similar philosophy, absolutely. Another question from the chat is, is Perseverance in the Horror rating making its way into Torg Eternity? We'll answer that more directly in the Aurora section. Yeah. Uh, we have a different mechanic for that, which I will describe during that. The, we're capturing the notion of it, but not quite the same way. So, uh, uh, I, I do want to mention one thing about the horror that we talked before. One thing I like about horror is the traditional RPG thing is to keep party unity. So the party works together on somewhere. Whereas in the horror, it can upend that where everybody's paranoid and everybody's against each other. And yet their chances get worse and worse because they're paranoid. And in a comedic sense, um, if you've played Betrayal and House on the Hill, one of the scenarios in that uh, game, you all enter the house, kind of working together, figuring stuff out. And then the scenario is unlocked. And one of them is where a giant bird comes, picks up the house and flies off with it with you in it. And there are two <laughs> parachutes, but five players. And so all of a sudden, everybody's unity is gone and everybody's running to find those shoots to get the hell out of there. <laughs> that's the kind of stuff I like. It can't run a campaign that way. It's a one-off. Um, yeah, no. So, yeah, I think for me, the... The target for horror, the reason I would want to run horror uh, rather than other kinds of uh, role-playing um, is to push people just a little bit. Um, so, you know, in, in education, there's a thing called scaffolding, uh, which is where you're, you find where people are what they, as far as what they know or what they're comfortable with, 
Um, and then you take them just a little bit farther than that. Uh, and that's how, you know, that's how learning happens. That's also how growth happens in, you know, in terms of emotional barriers and, and other things like that. And I think that pushing people's you know, scaffolding people just a little bit more in their squickiness tolerance or their, uh, you know, disturbing con conceptual horror to tolerance. Those are the things that I'm looking for. Uh, I mean, it was a fun game, Eric, but I don't know if I like that we were all covered in pig's blood at the end of it. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, that was scaffolding for someone else, Daryl. Uh <laughs> So, I think it's Joe Hill who said that horror isn't about sadism. It's about extreme empathy. Yes. Yeah. So we, we've had some insight into some different craft areas from education to acting to uh, quotes from uh, 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 right there is an example, other game systems. For those that are looking to add to their horror RPG toolkit, what are some resources you'd recommend? And then uh, I'd like each person to, to recommend uh, a resource for those in chat and those that watch this on demand. If they're looking to expand their horror repertoire, where would you recommend they get started? Well, I, I said like the games that we've mentioned, I would definitely say, take a look at 10 candles in terms of having, um, a significantly different frame for your game. And you can see a, if you're comfortable running that style and uh, what elements you might want to borrow for a more traditional, uh, you know, tabletop. I would recommend the upcoming crowdfunding Aurora from Torg. <laughs> <laughs> oh, no. You know, be, be the shill here, which we are going to be talking about very shortly. But I mean, in fairness, it is the horror genre for Torg, and we put a lot of effort into our own tips and tricks to keep a horror feel within a greater adventure campaign and to be able to pull that off without destroying your campaign while you do it. <laughs> so, yeah. I think that's a, a good advice too. This panel itself is an excellent resource for horror because you're dealing with industry experts and luminaries that have been uh, building products for uh, a long time in the upcoming Arosh uh, product is a great example where you can use it as both a resource to expand and a campaign setting to run. Buy it when it comes out. Back it. <laughs> Obey. Uh, I, I would uh, suggest looking into you know a lot of the interactive um, horror experiences, especially uh, video games, um, like What Remains of Edith Finch uh, is a really good one that I would recommend. Um, and yeah, other games like that where, um, you know, certainly there are the, uh, the jump scare, um, the, the jump scare, games you know there are a lot of those uh but then there are also just kind of the ambient eeriness games and those are those are worth exploring uh just seeing how they do that um atmosphere atmosphere does a lot to bring players into the game And I'd say just go buy a Ouija board and ask Captain Howdy how to run your thing. <laughs> <laughs> um, I'm gonna ask the one. question in the mirror. <laughs> I'm going to throw one out there too. There's a uh, so I'm a filmmaker by trade. For those of you that don't know me, um, and uh, there's a book by Norman Holland, who's a film editing instructor at USC, and was an industry editor in uh, his book, the lean forward moment, which isn't that expensive. It's easy to get used copies. Now uh, talk about the way uh, ways of using different mechanisms, sensory mechanisms like uh, color or lighting or sound uh, in applying these to get the audience member or player participant to lean forward in their chair and become invested. Um, even if you're not making a film, you can kind of play into player psychology and uh, identify uh, how to facilitate encounters and sessions in general um, 
Uh, so it's an excellent resource on that, mostly just dealing with uh, what I'd call audience psychology, or in this case, player psychology. So, yeah, and a big component of that is knowing when to break the tension and when to keep the tension. You know, because there are, like, in a lot of horror things, there is that moment of, you know, genuine excitement or comedy or whatever. And it can either wreck everything or set you up to get nailed even harder, you know, a, a couple minutes later. And being able to get a feel at your table with your players for where that line is and how to throttle it up and down is crucial. So my next question, and this is kind of a, a free for all. Uh, I like to do this when I moderate panels. It's what question would the uh, a panelist member like to ask another panelist member? So I'm going to give you a chance to pick <laughs> on each other. So like you're all here and it's like, you get to ask each other a question. So Bill, who are you picking on? What question do you want to hear them answer? <laughs> uh, I, I want to learn more about those acting method differences from Eric. <laughs> uh, okay, so uh, people often hear about Stanislavski's method, um, which is not a, a, a fully accurate representation of Stanislavski himself. It's more the Americans uh, and, and British teachers who took this Russian guy translated and didn't quite get everything he was saying. Uh, if you read him in the original Russian, it's a little different. But it's there's still this idea that the method um, is you have to access emotions or experiences that you have personally felt and use those for your character. Um, Dread is built on this idea um, that you are taking something physical and the emotion that comes from it, you are then putting that into your character. Um, Meisner uh, is a different school of acting thought uh, and is more about, um, it, it's more of a meta-awareness thing where I'm, just thinking, hey, what does my character want, and how do I get it? And I'm just going to do that, um, and that's that's how I produce the emotion. Is the the emotion comes from acting on what I want and trying to decide how to get it. Um, and that's so so the emotion is sort of shared between me and the character, rather than something from my past that I then put into my character. Um, so Dread doesn't work for me real well um, because I I inherently separate the Jenga tower from what's happening in the story. And that is exactly the opposite of what you're supposed to do. Uh, <laughs> so that's that's why it doesn't work for me. Probably also just Butterfingers. <laughs> well, yeah, I mean, I stuck it there, and that's definitely a part of it. Uh, <laughs> Similar to Torg, uh, the that initiative. Does... Go ahead. Now, it Go does on. make me think about, you know, people think of player styles, players who get really deep into the role playing. Would my character do this? Motivations, the strategic types. What are the best ones for your horror game, though? I never thought about it in that way. Yeah. If your ideal player type to run in a game. Anybody got an opinion? Uh, Somebody who spooks easy. Somebody who's really <laughs> yeah. interested in spooks but, easy. <laughs> I don't know if that's a type. So much as certain players do, certain players don't. <laughs> but the strategic guys, for instance, the guys who are coming in thinking all strategy, to me that would be a harder to run a game for because they're constantly going to be trying to, to, to well, plan their way out when what you're really trying to do is scare them. Sort so, of. So, yeah. Oh, go ahead. I was going to say, I love uh, playing with the strategic types in horror because I, I essentially have my psychological profile on them. They're counting resources, damage per round, their movement, and you start restricting these things. Even if it doesn't mean anything, I want them to see that they, they're doing the math in their head and they're like, this is a lose-lose situation. Now, it's it's 
it's a false narrative that I'm presenting to them almost where uh, I, I want to sort of play into uh, them feeling as if uh, it's stacked against them. I kind of play in a cycle between hope and fear as well, where I do break it. You know, sometimes they get their come up and sometimes they don't. Um, but uh, I'm a very strategic, tactile, meta uh, player myself. And like somebody goes, you know, it, we're just going to give Grant a hint of something that uh, – Something a little beyond his grasp, something that hits a little too hard, something he can't run from. He's got no tricks to get out of this. He, he will feel like his character's going to die. And uh, we'll let him stew there for a second in the horror. Then maybe it's the end, maybe it's not. But um, they, they kind of deal into my psychology. So uh, as uh, Greg mentioned earlier, my game masters know me very well as a player. And uh, kind of deal with that. I want those cooperative yeah, types that are really going to pretend analytic. to be scared, even if they're not. <laughs> that's going to help everyone else. <laughs> I mean, seriously, it does. It makes a huge difference. Someone yeah. that's going to play along. Uh, I found because often really I'm, analytical... I'm drawing. Oh, go ahead. Go ahead. I was just going to say the, the really analytical folks uh, can can fall into despair when they very clearly see that everything is hopeless. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, go ahead, Greg. That I, I found the, the people who like having detailed character backgrounds that are flawed or some trauma in the past, and they expect the GM to play with that, they're ideal candidates for horror. Because they'll buy into saying that things things can go wrong and you're yes. expected to deal with the fact that things are going wrong. And so they're they're predisposed to be successful, you know, narratively in horror. They want their buttons pushed. This is a good. Deal. Yeah. Actually, I've got a question for Grant Ellis. Yes. Is that is that legit? Which one? I'm legit. I'll allow it. <laughs> <laughs> no, because it ties back into sort of knowing your audience and stuff. So I dropped into your uh, your Twitch live stream of the horror game where you're exploring the farmhouse. And I was trying to decide if your co-player was having a good time. Oh my gosh. Because... Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay. okay. I, I couldn't tell. Okay. So, yeah. And the funny thing is, he invites me every night to play. So there's a video game that's come out uh, by Kinetic Gaming's Phasmophobia, hashtag not sponsored. This is a Torg stream. But uh, every night, a uh, podcaster, RPG podcaster, Rudy Basso, who also runs Torg Eternity on WebDM, uh, invites me to play this kind of... We're, we're ghost investigators, but not ghost hunters. We have to identify what the ghost is going to be, and we might die in the, in the process. And I have lots of audio clips on Twitch of Rudy Basso screaming and crying and begging and then feeling guilt when another player dies due to his foolishness. And um, he absolutely loves the game and uh, kind of going into the other conversation, like who are the ideal players? So they have me who just has steel nerves, but if I scream, I'm going to scream the loudest and I might not come back for a day or two. Um, <laughs> and I just sound very matter of fact. So I'm, I'm normally sent to do the more perilous tasks, which uh, usually they don't send me. They say, no, don't go. It's too dangerous. And I'm like, look, <laughs> we have to get evidence. Otherwise, we're not getting paid. Um, but Rudy, yeah, it's it's great. And he felt so bad. And hashtag save Rudy. Um, he, uh, he was having, yeah, chat, chat's got it. Reality Raiders 3, uh, the sequel to Reality Raiders 1 and 2, our Torg uh, fictional movies that take place on WebDM. Um, but uh yeah, Rudy has an awesome time. He says, you know, I'm the biggest scaredy cat in the world. But I'm glad I play this with you because if you were a big scaredy cat too, I might have less fun. But the fact that you're very steel nerves, very calm, very matter of fact, kind of makes this fun. But also <laughs> it's fun. To, he, he gets a kick when he finally watches me lose it too. So yeah, like uh, I, I really, yeah, we, we enjoy playing those games and um we're expanding our ghost ghost uh paranormal investigative squad but we're specifically choosing personality types that kind of lean into what everyone mentioned here it's the same as getting together an rpg group there has to be buy-in uh we have to complement each other we have to be cooperative um 
And we each want to make sure that we've uh, consented and agreed to this play experience. Um, there's people where they don't want to play the game where the ghost kills their character and they lose all their money and cool ghost hunting equipment. I'm all about that, though. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, since I was asked a question, uh, I'm going to throw a question to Daryl. Um, uh -oh. And uh, the, the question is, uh, inspiration for your costume tonight. Um <laughs> <laughs> I happened to have an Iron Man mask a couple years ago. I went as white trash Iron Man, so I had like the white beater and the 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 chest plate that you you kind of shows through my shirt here. Um, and we were looking for something to cover the face, and I was like, "Oh no, I don't have anything." And I'm like, "Oh wait, I've got that mask!" Aha! And it also gives me an excuse to drink like all night. So, and there was a very famous Iron Man storyline where Tony Stark is you know battling alcoholism called Demon in a Bottle. So. I thought it all ties together. Beautiful. <laughs> well done, sir. So that means it's my turn to ask anyone else a question. I want to ask, I was going to ask either Greg or Bill. I think I'm going to do Bill. So like in game terms, what do you think is a fate worse than death? Right? Because like in horror games, you're always being threatened with death. But really the, the big one is, Oh no, there's way worse stuff than death. You know, <laughs> what can, what would be one of yours? Hmm. Well, I mean, really, it depends on the game and how invested people are. You know, the, the whole idea in Werewolf is that uh, you're losing what you love every day. Um, the the worm humanity is encroaching on nature and all your sacred spaces, and so you know, it's really just that it's losing what you love. You know, when you're you're imperiled loved ones or something else, you know the game could be your family, your country, whatever it is that uh, your character is most driven by. So I mean, death's just for you, but if you love what if, if you lose that which you're fighting against these things for, that's the worst thing. Noting it down here, no reason. <laughs> <Wow>. <laughs> <laughs> Take away what they love. <laughs> <laughs> so ask every character what does your player what your what does your character love the most? Yeah. Fluffy your dog, okay, writing it down. Well, right. Well, and and so and for like a fun like aside, you know, because I don't want me to talk over other people, right? But that was one of the uh, original mechanics in Deadlands that was so cool. Was every character on their sheet has a space. What's your worst nightmare? Mm. Right? Like, no reason. Dot, dot, dot. <laughs> like, when you build your character, you've got to fill in. Like, this is what terrifies my guy. And hand it to the GM who's like, I don't know what I'll do with that. <laughs> Brilliant. <Background. laughs> we do have a question from the chat that I'd like to throw out there. That is, what is the spookiest enemy you've used in... A game in difficulty is no gaunt man. For it was me? a game I played once. Sorry. Go ahead. I, Go ahead. I didn't use it, but I experienced it. It was actually a Call of Cthulhu game, and it was just me and the GM. And my character had somehow gotten stuck down in Antarctica into the mountains of madness and i was trying to get out of the place and the effective use of sound that he did and he did and he was just telling me about the sounds and stuff and somehow the thing just built up and it was just hearing things off around the corner were far scarier than even if a shug off had come around the corner because then okay i know what it is but there was just the sounds i thought that was the most effective i've ever experienced and i wish I could run a game that used just that, but I've never had a situation where I could use it as effectively. I think it was the one-on-one -on -one thing that helped a lot also. Uh, so mine's probably, I have several LARP uh, enemies that I've used because uh, I've been 
a uh, long time LARP player in both campaign and one shot LARPs, and also uh, a, a GM uh, slash storyteller for vampire LARPs on numerous occasions. Um, the the thing that I tend to do uh, as much as possible is unsettling, uh, which is really great to do in a LARP because um, you get people feeling that. Uh, so, like, for instance, uh, there is a, a one-shot LARP called Preacher Man, uh, and because... I am a pastor's son and have the background. I have played the Preacher Man in two different groups' uh, uh, rendition of this game. And the Preacher Man is not a good man. Uh, I'll just say that uh, to not spoil the LARP too much, but um, he he is the villain, no question. Uh, <laughs> and, and yeah, that's, so that's that kind of you know, person of authority who acts a little off and the more you learn, just the more upsetting it becomes. That's that's kind of the, the spooky that I enjoy. Yeah, for me, it's the creepy little kid archetype. You know, the one that mm. probably has something more going on, but you can never prove it. And because there's a kid, like reasonable players will have like a taboo, right? Like, some villains are like, monster, and you're just going to kill it, right? But the creepy little kid, you can't do that. You're like, ah, I got to interact with this in a different way. Like, <laughs> And the more you talk to him, the worse it gets. And you're like, I got this sinking feeling, but ah, like, what do you do? Like, Those are my, my favorites, both as a GM and when it happens to me as a player. For me, I'd um, say, go oh, ahead. Go ahead. I was going to say, for me, I typically get people, uh, usually younger folks with uh, self-learning AI and algorithms that mature as gameplay goes on. And I typically like to start them as an ally. Um, and then they start to realize that the AI is corralling, it's removing their resources, it's denying them the ability to function, and the AI will justify its actions as this is, this is for your good. Um, and it's also a... Uh, unembodied entity most of the time and just kind of omnipresent um kind of like me as a game master i have no body <laughs> on stream i'm just a voice <laughs> go ahead greg <laughs> yeah that's so mine is is similar to grant's is not necessarily somebody who's helpful but somebody you interact with who has a perfectly normal function that is later revealed to be really really creepy <laughs> And then the players will fill in the blanks once they find example A. They go, holy crap, what about those previous 30 sessions? Mm. Let's go find out, shall we? So we've, we've, we've given a lot of good information. And um, I, I do have a, a – this is sort of a general question for the panel – is there any particular question as it comes to uh, designing for horror and RPGs or any advice that you're actually tired of and you'd like to answer it for the last time here definitively? <laughs> no. <laughs> nope. <laughs> Honestly, no. So, like, yeah. I live for this. Uh, I love yeah. talking design. I love even the stuff that's been tromped over because my opinions on it are usually different from like the the standard knowledge so yeah there's i, I love picking it all apart that's just yeah me, i'm similar mine mine mm -hmm. like it's like my philosophy changes from time to time as i learn and grow and it's and as the world around me changes um i was curious though anyone else well i i, I do have one uh and that is um and this is something that my friend Phil Beckion would also say uh, is his one on this, uh, which is don't do bait and switch. Uh, do not bait and switch your players. Don't tell them they're playing one game and suddenly they're in a horror game. If you're going to play a horror game, tell them it's going to be a horror game. Um, and and I, I feel strongly about that. Yeah, I don't really have any except no, you can't be a white hunter. That's it. 
<laughs> that was that was in the fac for our uh, werewolf larp. <laughs> the character creation fac included. No. Uh, <laughs> and are there any other interesting trends that you've seen in horror? We've talked about some of the new developments, but is there a trend within the horror genre that's interesting? Like for me, I've started playing more silent RPGs, uh, particularly during uh, this time of a global pandemic where they're just entirely text-based. Um, different people have different information over, over time, but it's just silent, 100% silent. Hmm. I don't know. Is it anyone like of the, I, as, as I mentioned before, I'm the outlier. So usually whatever the popular trend is, I'm like, I hate it. You know yeah. give, an give an example of bucking the trend. Like what's the direction you see well, people go. And then you're like, here's another way to look at it. Cause I, I like a fresh perspective as well. Yeah. So I can't think of a good one that could be shared in a public forum. Ooh, I love that. Yeah, run out of town. <laughs> yeah, I love that. I'll keep that opinion to myself. <laughs> it's like if it's popular, though, like I, it's like odds are, and this is why I shouldn't be in charge of a game line <laughs> because I've always got these very different ideas, you know, than than how people are going right now. So I always tell them, don't don't listen to me ever, right? Like I'm going to be wrong a hundred percent of the time. But do back the upcoming crowdsource, a crowdfunded, a, a roche setting, because uh, there's. See. Well, and that's because it's not just me. I've got three other people. I've, I've got Greg, and I've got Lehman, and I've got John, and I've got Tracy, and they keep me on track. Yeah. They tell me when I'm going screwy. And I've had too much tequila. That sort of a ties into a, a technique I've used before in horror, um, which actually comes from uh, acting. We've done some discussion on acting, a technique called working the opposite, where I play everything straight, not trying to be scary at all, just very calm, and everyone just kind of starts thinking, there's something else here, there's something deeper, and they all start psyching themselves out. I'm, there is... <laughs> They start tearing apart the entire adventure, slowly uh, driving themselves up the walls, and then um, uh, really it was, there was nothing there until there is. A uh, question from the chat, though, <laughs> is uh, for you personally, what is something that will scare you or creep you out while playing a horror TTRPG? Hmm. Effective use of lighting and sound effects in the play environment. That would get me. Yeah, I think it's things like a ticking clock, like that Jenga tower. Stuff like that that builds anxiety, especially when uh, you really got to meet that finish line real quick. And things are getting in the way. But that's tough to achieve. My, my personal kind of threshold tends to revolve around body horror. <laughs> um, and I have a pretty strong imagination. I don't need to see it. You just need to describe it. Ah, <laughs> <laughs> uh, yes, body horror. Yeah, I, I'm with Daryl. Horrible. It's kind of fun in a way. Sorry, Greg. Uh, go ahead. Yeah, I, I'm I'm with Daryl that the environment, the play environment that you're sitting in, can just make everything so much creepier. We, the scariest game I ever played in was back in my West End days, and we uh, there was a old asylum near Hershey, Pens somewhere in the vicinity of Hershey, Pennsylvania, that you could rent out for stuff because it was abandoned. Never doing that again. <laughs> 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 now it's just like what are we doing here we are at time for our panel we'd like to thank our panelists daryl eric bill and greg for their insights on the horror genre and for you in chat for being engaged and asking uh, some excellent questions 
Uh, we're going to switch over to Greg and Daryl to kick off a trivia contest that will go on uh, during our brief break. During the break, you'll see the trivia questions re-asked. You'll have time to, to try your best to uh, come up with the answers. So let's go ahead and kick it over to Daryl and Greg. Wait, I'm doing the trivia? <laughs> Uh-oh. <laughs> Do you have the questions? That wasn't the plan. <laughs> well, uh, we're just going to ask the questions out. So uh, I, w I was told to have you two on screen. Uh, 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 yeah, and that makes sense. Okay. Like, well, and mostly we'll be on screen judging you all, right? You know, and uh, no. as we're judging you, though, the you know, it, the well, well, and I'll keep saying this like over and over and over again. If you're joining us late, uh, whisper to Eric, Torg, or Treat to get your digital treats for showing up here. And after trivia, we're going to talk about Arorsh. You know what? Hopefully, people actually came here for. <laughs> you know, we'll, we'll we'll get some specifics and we'll we'll talk about that. You know what we're doing with the setting and when, very shortly. But Torg or treat to Eric. Also on Facebook, our costume contest, um, like the the prize. I mentioned this before. I'll repeat it for anyone that missed it. It is the one of a kind prototype cyber papacy all rolled up, uh, packet with art pockets for pencils, dice. There, there's, that's the only one we're ever going to do, you know, it, that I know of. So then that's going to be our, our prize for best costume. So share your, 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 your costume photos with us, please. You're, you're already dressed up for Halloween. You know, get the most out of it. <laughs> and, um, what we can do, uh, so I'm going to get, we'll make this uh, Daryl and Greg's choice. So there's two ways we can do this. Um, I have a trivia bot that I programmed that can ask the questions. It knows all the answers, and it can ask them in chat, and it'll be first to answer correctly. Um, uh, first to answer correctly, we'll we'll uh, we'll get the it's point. The yeah, essentially, essentially get it. Or uh, the next way we could do this, um, we can we can uh, uh, I can ask the questions. And uh, we can uh, switch to break, and the questions will be re-asked on the screen. And you can whisper me, um, Grant R. Ellis, on uh, uh, Twitch, and uh, I'm going to take first answer is is correct. So how do we? How would we like to do this? I can do one or the other. Automated. Which is which is easier for you? Uh, the easier for me is to use the bot. Let's bot it. Woo! Yeah. So I talk when the about bot asks it. Woo. We'll read it, you know, as yeah. well, you know, <laughs> yeah. so people can follow along. Yeah. So, uh, I, um, I, uh, I mentioned the, the evil AIs earlier. So what we're going to do is I'm going to switch to, uh, our trivia transition screen. And then I'm going to get that, uh, bot up in just a second. Uh, so yeah. let me and launch my bot. Also... Yeah, you've also like you know I hate to be all technical while we're switching over. You got uh, Greg Windows and Tracy's window switched, so we're not seeing Greg right now. Uh, but it's a better picture of me, so I'll take it. <laughs> <laughs> Something must have changed down below. All right, so let me. We're gonna switch. We messed our, it up. We're gonna switch to <laughs> we're gonna switch to our uh, trivia screen. I'm go we're gonna mute out here for a second. We're gonna get some music back on, and then we and we are moments away from asking questions. So stand by.
right, chat. It's time to give you the answers. Now, I have a, a group of panelists behind me on the other side, and they're going to uh, uh, give the, uh, perform the Eroge panel. It's a performance now. Um, make sure you applaud at the end. Uh, but I'm going to go over the questions and answers from the chat bot. Uh, we did cycle through all the questions, and I will audit the chat logs to make sure that we get uh, prizes to the correct answers. Um, so the first question that was asked was an easy question. It was, which of the Cosms did not appear in the original Torg box set? The answer was Tharkold. Uh, the second question, the harder question, is what is the average lifespan of a Tharkold do? And the answer was 250 years. I, I just want to say after programming this quiz, uh, I know a lot of Torg trivia now. Um, uh, the third question is, which of the countries does the living land have stele in during the initial invasion? The answer is Canada, the United States of America, and Mexico. Uh, the fourth question, who is Turek Ironheart in a relationship with? with? And it is Rose Elaine. Saul Chat, get that answer correctly. The next question is, what is Marcus Newman's hobby? Fantasy role-playing games was the correct answer. And which cosm is Thomas uh, Kane originally from? Akasha would be the answer. I can turn you on. So I'm going to put Daryl on so you can hear Daryl. Daryl, you are live. Yeah, so and there was kind of a, an interesting backstory on that because some people were like, Thomas Kane, who, what? you know, And they didn't recognize him until our Heroes of the Possibility War uh, book came out. But he's actually in the Torg Eternity core book in the from from the very first publication. When we kickstarted it originally, we were looking for ways to get some backer participation. And one of the ideas was, well, oh, you know, we've got these seats on a on the Delphi Council, and we don't really have it defined who they are. We know who a couple of them are. But how about we'll let people make up their own characters for that if they, you know, if they're backing at that level. And so uh, Thomas Kane was one of those backers and ha had a, a very intricate, you know, backstory as most of them do. And the way it ended up coming together for the book is we kind of had to fit it into one paragraph. So there wasn't a, a whole lot of room to try and get a lot of that in. But it is there if you look. Last page of the book, you'll see Thomas Kane, and you'll you'll see we may or may not say directly Akasha, or we may hint at it. I can't remember. But in Heroes of the Possibility War, we expanded on those characters because we've done so much more with the backer archetypes, you know. And uh, the 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 backer <laughs> who who runs Thomas Kane was literally uh, preparing for surgery when the Kickstarter launched and thought he was going to miss it. And the surgery ended up like he had, he had to, to, to go through it really quick so he could get in and get that character. And it's a great story. He tells it way better than I do, but you know, all the fun things behind the scenes on those Delphi council and many of our archetype backers, you know, that are out there. So just wanted to share that since we were talking about it. All right. Uh, the next question was an impossible difficulty question. Uh, what was judged to be the most difficult question of the group, assuming that uh, my computer will let me pull it up. And the question is, what remains dormant in a tomb or temple until a seal is broken? The answer is walking gods. Correct answer to that question. An additional question is in the original in the original Torque setting, what was the name of the otherworldly place where dead horrors lingered until they could be reborn? And that answer is the Waiting Village. In the original Torg novels, what was the name of the werewolf who sided with the Storm Knights against the Gaunt Man? Their name was Cursed. What is the strange head at the top of the Gaunt Man's cane supposed to represent? The Caridon. Oh yeah, the Caradon. We've done so the much with Caridon. that. <laughs> and uh, what was the name of the island which the Amazons call home? Hespera. The bonus question is the original name of the island was the Carpathos. And uh, what is the source of the Lurks? The Abomination Engines. What is the name of the Cyber Papacy's Cross Atlantic Luxury Cyberliner? 
It's Estrella de Viage. And then, uh, what form do Stele generally take in Isle? In Pillars with Carved Dragon Heads and Wings. Uh, saw that uh, uh, answered multiple times correctly in chat uh, with variations off that answer. And then finally, uh, what was the first Living Land Wonder explored in, tor in a Torg Eternity project, uh, product? And it was Ukan. So without further ado, uh, we uh, thank you so much for standing by. This was uh, the last overlay I made for tonight's production. Um, we are going to turn you over to our panelists for the Arosh panel. Arosh, Friends, you are live. Arosh panel. Hey, everybody. So why don't we go around and we'll introduce each of our panelists one at a time uh, as you see them here on the screen. So Daryl, Greg, John, Lehman, then Tracy. And uh, we will just go across and down in that order. Who you are and what your involvement is with the project. So yeah, I'm Daryl Hayhurst. I was running the line until fairly recently. Greg Gordon took over, but I'll let him talk about that. I still lean in and help out, and I've done a lot of the writing on Arorsh, so it was appropriate for me to be here. My main focus right now is Space 1889 upcoming for Ulysses Spiel. I'm Greg Gordon, uh, line developer on Torg Eternity, and I'm a contributor to Arorsh, and I'm, uh, uh, I would say I'm putting in some of the really... Uh, Odd stuff. <laughs> you can blame me oh. for for that. <laughs> well, I think we all need a little odd and a roar, Greg. That'll make it happen, brother. <laughs> but, uh, uh, my name is uh, John Watson. Uh, uh, mainly, I've worked on uh, the Tharkold box set uh, with Daryl and many of the others on here have contributed as well. Um, I kind of waited and hoped, prayed. I could have some involvement in Arorsh, and uh, it did happen. So you'll see some of my stuff in there. Not as much contribution as many of the others on here, but things, uh, including archetypes and uh, some other stuff as well. We'll take it. <laughs> we'll talk. I got four pages. <laughs> yeah, I'm all in. You are muted, Lehman. Oh. I, I hear him. I yeah, we can hear him. Here. Let me unmute. Let me unmute you. Here's what I believe it is. I think uh, you may have been coming through uh, when you were moving your camera earlier, um, uh, when we were on the other panel, and so I might have manually muted you. I should be able to hear you now. Can you hear me? I can hear you. Okay, so I'm Lehman Crafton, and like John, I worked a lot on the the Tharkold wave. Uh, with Aurorsh, I've been more of kind of like in the background going, hey, here's an idea. Here, here's an idea. What about this? And uh, also working with some archetypes and map, maps and stuff like that. So. <clears throat> uh, and I'm Tracy Sizemore. I've done a couple of Delphi missions over the course of the Cosms coming out. So I did some something for Nile Empire, and I did a uh, Tharkold one and a Cyber Papacy one. And now I am half of the team that's writing the uh, the big Arorsh adventure uh, with Brian Reeves, who's awesome, and I wish he was here, but that's okay. <laughs> Tracy is also very famous for a, a particular podcast for Savage Worlds, the Savage Interludes. If you're not listening yes, to it, you I'm should be. I'm famous, world famous for Savage Interludes. Right? Here. What's the Torg? What's the Torg equivalent of horse famous? <laughs> so we had a number of questions specific to Arosh in our earlier panel, and um, I think some of these would be good to ask to the panel uh, as the audience has waited uh, with bated breath. And um, one was a Sorry question. About the baby. <laughs> no, that's hey. It wasn't a bait and switch. It was a bait and wait. Um, so <laughs> it was. Uh, so the the first question that I, I see here is, um, uh, how, will you be integrating uh, modern horror into Arosh? So will there be uh, 
uh, creepy pastas or topa monsters like Slenderman or Candle Cove? Is it going to be more traditional? So, uh, what, what do you think? Or rather, what 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 can you share? Well, everyone who knows me knows that I'll share everything that I can in these panels. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh. I'll say a few things about that and everyone else that wants to pitch in because a lot of people have contributed monsters or adventures and things like that. So when we approach the war zones of an area, we usually sectionalize them and there are kind of different elements in each sub, right? So in uh, our approach for Arorsh, the four subsections are kind of the different, you know, major subgenres of horror. So we've got one area where it's more psychological, one area where it's more stalking based, you know, the, the serial killer and all that. One area where it's like monsters, classic and otherwise, and you'll face, you know, and one where it's more about hauntings and eeriness, you know. And those are all different flavors that we're going to be addressing in different ways within Arorsh. And uh, for the more specifically modern ones, um, Usually we're right now. I don't have like a, the slender. Man. Well, all right. We don't have the <laughs> slender man directly, but I will say one of the Gospog that's in the Torque Retreat packet has a lot of characteristics <laughs> in common, you know, with, with that. So, and we haven't finished all the monsters, so we might address that more directly. That's also one opinion. of the, one of the concepts, um, I'm working on is yeah, I'm calling the bleed, which actually will be part of the, the encounter tonight. That will give you the mechanism to bring in things like the, the slender man. Cause the bleed is a Rorsch is unique in that it's haunted by other cosms. It's invaded or killed. And the got man has the ability to pull things in from almost anywhere. As long as they have died along the way. So, an example of that will be tonight, and, and then you can sort of see that, oh, yeah, you could drag in this from Pan Pacifica and turn it into something like Slender Man. You could drag in this from the Nile Empire, and you can get, you'll be able to uh, introduce almost any horror element you can want and still be, you know, perfectly fine inside a Rorsch. But in general, a Rorsch is going to be Victorian. And it's going to be one of those four horror tropes. Go ahead. Mm, so I don't like uh, generally think in terms of the modern horror sort of tropes that way. So um, I, I think in terms of like, we were, you know, there was a lot of sort of discussion in the early development of how we we're going to, approach Arorsh and specifically the big adventure for Arorsh. And, um, you know, I, I had my, my input early on that I, I approach it more from a twin peaksy type standpoint where there's, there's psychological horror, there's horror of things you don't understand, but at the root of it, there's empathy there's understanding, there's connection, right? Because th I think that that's a, a very important aspect of horror is that sort of connection um, or understanding or empathy of what's happening. Because if you don't have that, you kind of don't feel the horror. And so my monsters, and the thing is, the, the big adventure is, it's much more investigative than it is combative, right? So my monsters are very... Um, impenetrable <laughs> in the sense that you can try to fight them and yes, you might win, but that's about as good as odds as I'm going to be able to give you, you know? Um, and in some cases it's very ill-advised to try to straight up fight them, you know, most cases actually. So, so the, the whole thing is trying to sort of avoid that kind of thing. So, so in terms of that uh, modern sort of those tropes of horror, that's not how I think. So, so we've been, Brian and I have been, you know, sort of noodling about how to do that. And Brian actually does think along those lines, much more along those lines than I do. So you'll see that sort of distinctive um, uh, point of view shift as you go through the adventure. And I think it's a great thing, actually. I think it's wonderful. And uh, what Brian has done is amazing and stuff that I 
uh, I can't do. And I think that's true also of me doing stuff that Brian is not particularly, you know, into or, or good at, right? And I think that's a strength of it. Yeah. And that's very much why on all of our large adventures, with the exception of, well, not even, not even the exception of the first one, we try to have at least two, maybe three writers involved in it so we can get that shifting perspective and point of view on it. And actually, originally, the first one was all Shane, but he did bring me in on some of those. So there was some collaboration there. It's still mostly Shane, but there's a little bit of me in, in that mm -hmm. one, too. So, yeah. Yeah, and that's how some of the best ideas uh, I've been a part of in this whole process. I know with Daryl, you know, I have like completely disagreed on ideas, and then <laughs> we met in the middle, and it ended up being something extraordinarily uh, well. Well, I'm 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 excited about it. Uh, you know, things like that. So you know, just further to Tracy's point, as he said, that diversity. Well, everybody else benefits from that. We do as well uh, from those kind of things, especially in in Aurora. She was got a lot of collaborators on this. Yeah, it is It is a difficult cosm. It's very, very difficult. And part of the fun of it is collaborating with Brian. You know, uh, we talk all the time and I'll throw out like, well, I wrote this today. And he'll be, oh, that's awesome. What about, and, and, and this. I'm like, oh, yes, definitely and that. So now I'm going to be adding that, you know, and, and what idea comes from where you never know really because it's so collaborative and so interesting because we both bring something different and equally like cool to the table, right? And now that we've rambled on that question. <laughs> but, <laughs> we got, is, we've got an hour to fill ramble in. <laughs> in, this is, in this essay. Um, so we have some more. So we had a question and uh, it's been asked multiple times. And the question, uh, they're interested <laughs> around, uh, there was this concept of a uh, perseverance mechanic. Um, how are you, how are you, uh, uh, what new mechanics are going to be interested that deal around that concept of persistence, perseverance, stress, etc. in, uh, yeah. Corrosion? So, yeah. And, and one of the, the, one of the main goals for perseverance in the old one was to set up the monsters to make it more difficult to defeat them until you had learned about them. You know, and that kind of ties into the, this notion of empathy, you know, and all that, you know. And so, like, if you can just, like, walk up to the, the big bad monster and, you know, I spend my possibility and I roll it up and I kill him, well, that's not, that doesn't speak to the horror genre, you know, at all. But one of our early design choices was we didn't want to layer a lot of special rules in as we went. Like, we can do it and we do it in some places, but we try to have a very light touch and keep that the grammar of the rules as consistent you know, as possible. So in the original, yeah, they had per perseverance where there's this massive sliding scale that as you would learn, you know, uh, facts about them, like you, you'd grow essentially in relative power, but until you had that, your relative power would be very low and, and it balanced out through that. Um, my approach, and these are not final, like everything that we talk about, it's still under testing. And in a, in a few minutes, we'll announce like the day, you know, of the, the crowdfunding and all that. That's, we'll talk about that in a moment. But the mechanic that we are doing for that now uh, to, to mimic that is the big horrors, you know, they've got three or five possibilities or whatever. The idea is Monsters at that high level, you know, the nightmares, we call them, their possibilities refresh every round, which essentially makes them invincible. Like, yeah, maybe I, if they start with five, they refresh to five every single round. Every single round. And that's really, really important. Like, you know, like, so technically you could get really lucky and win, but like, it's really brutal. And they're but, also tough to begin with, right? Yeah. yeah. I mean, that's true. yeah. <laughs> but, and then the notion, how we do it is as you investigate them, there are, you know, however many possibilities they have in their refresh, there are that many like crucial facts about them, about their background or their loved ones or their origin story. And as you discover those, you, you know, each one that you discover reduces that refresh. So the more you know about them, 
the easier they become to tackle. And so if you learned all five facts, what was refresh five is now no refresh at all. It's still a monster with five possibilities, but it can be tackled. And that's how we're trying to approach that investigation is crucial. It's the you know number one most important thing. And you can have multiple encounters with these monsters because early on it was like, oh man, that, that's too much to handle. We've got to run. And even if you do kill them, if they've got possibilities and refresh, they're going to come back. But once you've knocked out that refresh, because one of those five is the true death. <laughs> I'd like to add something to that. Mm -hmm. I, I'm a, as some people know, I'm a huge fan of old Torg, but I love this new method because in old Torg, as a game master, there were a lot of times with that old uh, perseverance that it was just like, I felt like Oprah going, you're marked for death and you're marked for death and you're marked for death and you're marked for death. <laughs> marked for death. Because there, you, you could get, the game master could get so many points and I believe it was like, you know, each bad thing costs an, a different amount of points. But you, you could get so many of them that it's just like, oh, what do I do? What do I want? Okay, everybody marked for death type thing. Where this kind of, it, it keeps that aspect of the investigation up, but you don't have to just throw all these bad things on the the players and characters. You get yeah, to do that sort of the, anyway. <laughs> right? The reaction, that, that's the interesting, also interesting part, right? Is that as you hunt these nightmares with their refresh of possibilities and you discover their secrets, it's likely that it's going to get back to them. You know, you're going to, they're going to find out that you're hunting them and that makes life more difficult for you. And that's sort of one of the themes of the adventure that we're writing, the major adventure we're writing. And um, it's very exciting because it's sort of, it, it gives you that creeping, like, you know, hunted feel, watch your back kind of thing, while at the same time steeping you into this environment of just weird, really creepy horror. You know, and you, you never know how things are going to come after you or when things are going to come after you. And when you're hunting a nightmare, it could happen at any time, you know, and that's part of like that, that, that brings that mechanic back is that like you are marked for death because you are hunting a nightmare. You mm -hmm. are in trouble because you are making yourself known to them, you know. So a question from chat. Um... This question is from Mr. Furious Triple Zero. Um, can you expand on true death mechanics and are waiting villages still a thing? I'm always talking. So if someone else wants to take that, if not, I'll jump in. Um, as far as true death mechanics, the way that we've got it like right now, and this is also subject to change, right? Is we've got uh, a monster can have an, a number of secrets and that secret is associated with their possibility refresh, right? So as, as, as you discover different secrets and, and this could mean traveling all around everywhere to find, you know, to the furthest reaches of crazy to find some of these secrets about this particular nightmare you're trying to find or hunt. And, um, and so once you've discovered it, you have to reveal it to them it has to be, you have to confront them directly and reveal those secrets to them. That's part of the mechanic of it. That's what, ref that's what takes away one of their refresh. And then the final secret, and it depends on how many secrets that nightmare has, is their true death. Like, what do you need to do to make sure, or, or you know, what conditions do you need to meet? Or what, what things do you need to do to this, to this monster to make sure it actually doesn't come back? And um, and that's a special one, kind of. We're kind of treating that as special. Um, and in the adventure, we're kind of treating it as special to the point where, like, only the nightmare itself can reveal that. But that doesn't. That's not necessarily a real thing. But in the adventure, we're sort of leaning in that direction. You know, I don't know how much we want to give away, so I'll, I, I, I'll probably be giving away too much. But that's 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 kind of the mechanics of it, and it's very exciting because it it forces you to confront these nightmares and to not only confront them physically and like as enemies, but also sort of reveal these really intimate secrets about them, and you know, have that sort of moment of possible empathy for them. Um, and that's partly what I love about it. 
Yeah. And as for the waiting village in specific, right now we're not treating it as a, a location because I, I think it it kind of diminishes the uncertainty and horror, you know, this kind of image of a waiting room. Like, I love Beetlejuice, but I don't really want us to have that kind of bureaucracy. <laughs> it's more like, well, they're out there. You know they can come back. You don't know when. It might be days, it might be months, it might be centuries. Like it's kind of all down to the individual creature. And we're, I don't intend to put a lot of detail into what is awaiting these creatures beyond, other than it's not good, but it's not permanent unless it's true death. Another question coming from Chad is that uh, this is a question from Prince Earwig. Uh, who answered multiple questions correctly during the trivia contest. Noise. Um, <laughs> the, uh, the question is, clearly the secrets override the core transparency idea. Bit more of a comment than a question, really, but then it follows with a question. Yeah. Um, are you expecting the transparency override to be a blanket expectation in Oroche? So, no. <laughs> but, yeah, yeah, so no. <laughs> um, but the way I'm handling it for the stuff I'm doing is, there will be creatures who have special abilities that prevent you from knowing certain things, mm. but in general, so in general, the transparency rules still apply, but there are, and that's one of the things though, is that I find when I, the limited play testing I've done, the uncertainty the fact that you have transparency and when you lose it, <laughs> that's more effective than never having transparency because <laughs> mm -hmm. they're used to it. And when something says you just don't know that you're like, Oh, dang it. <laughs> and so, you, you know, yeah. their fear quotient goes up. And I think that that's a more effective presentation for us rather than just saying, yeah, you don't know anything about a Rorsch because yeah. people like monster hunters should, you know? Yeah. Yeah. I, I agree with that. Like I, 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 wouldn't want the transparency rule to to go away um except in the in the sense that like you're obviously not going to know secrets you're obviously not going to know like what you we need to find out that's part of the that's the entire like in, investigative adventure that happens but once you confront them like unless there's some reason like there's some specific idea that we have in mind that we want to to make uh, to to veil over i would rather like keep it transparent and say like, yeah, they've got a melee defense of 20. Good luck. Right. Yeah. You know, <laughs> and, and we'll also do things like, and here's their three possibilities and you can see them refreshing. Yeah. So you know, there's three secrets, right? Yep. I can tell you find three, you're not going to do this. Like, you know, that, you know, that doesn't tell you what the secrets are, but it does let you know what you need to do. Yes. It's part of you being Storm Knights, right? That's part of what, that's your privilege, right? So we had a question earlier from the group as well, and I'm curious in the answer. And I think we hinted and uh, actually spoke to some of this question, but they, they're curious about the various world uh, history, mythology, and cultures apart from uh, Victorian horror that are being introduced into the setting. So uh, what can we learn about that? I'll let Greg talk first. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, again, wow, without going super spoilerific, there's a lot from core earth mythology that is dealt with in the Delphi missions where they introduce uh, a considerable number of, of mythic creatures. There will be uh, some from other cosms that have already been introduced and some from cosms we haven't found yet. So it's going to be a, quite a wide variety, but still Victorian horror is the, the core of, of Arosh. Right. Yeah. And uh, so, and when we talk about the Victorians themselves, so mo like most of their world was gone by the time the gaunt man was ready to move on. You know, and this is why there's so much stress on the Victorians on this one small part of that world because they had this whole other world culture, but most of them just got creamed, you know, and like kind of all the survivors have been flooding to, you know, that last light of hope. And I will go ahead and spoil it. Gaia doesn't make it right. <laughs> like when the God man moves on, that's it. They're done. 
and the, the the survivors they've they're either coming here or they've got nowhere else to go and that will be the point where we start to see there won't be many of them but we will talk about some of the vestiges of those other cultures like the rajani you know who like they would be what india was on gaia and they you know and so having them introduced into actual you know core earth india adds like a whole other element of like man who are these guys <laughs> what's going on with this you know and gives us more toys to to play with in our toy box so yeah i know yeah. that um i'm sorry go john ahead. go ahead Oh, no, you go, Tracy. I'll finish up after you go, brother. Um, I know that in in our our little section, our little sandbox that we're playing in, um, we're certainly introducing Victorian horrors, but we're also uh, dabbling in Indian myth and legend as well. So we are going there. And I know Brian is going there for sure, um, and I sort of go there a little bit, not not too much, but uh, I do I do uh, go into some of the culture stuff. So. Um, like, you know, the, the Sherpas and stuff like that. So we do end up sort of, um, dabbling in those sort of areas and, and that, that weird, crazy, like inextricable link between geography and culture. Right. So we are trying to actually, um, to, to emphasize that and not shy away from it and go ahead and go forward with it. So we are introducing like those elements from different, different places, both Indian and Victorian. Yeah. And this is yeah. one of the, Oh, go ahead, John. No, I was going to say kind of Tracy and I were about to kind of make the same comment. Uh, I know I, I wrote one of the uh, Delphi adventures, so I'm sure uh, since it was approved by Greg, it's okay to talk a little bit, not money spoilers, but uh, do. Uh, some of the things <laughs> about it, but uh, just going hand in hand, what Tracy said, you know, the biggest thing I did was was take from uh, uh, Indian culture some of their, you know, more uh, folklore kind of creatures and, you know, developed on that as well, um, which actually, without even actually thinking about it, kind of piggybacked on something with the uh, nightmares, um, uh, you know, to a degree. I wasn't thinking about that when I wrote it, but then when I was, was reading more as they were developing this, you know, it goes hand in hand with that. So I, I think everybody's on the same page with that. We're going to see a lot more from different cultures. Uh, I mean, the Gaunt Man is the most powerful of the High Lords. You know, of course, you know from those other realities and stuff. They're they're creatures, the the, the horrors of the night or whatever. We're going to see a lot of those kind of things. You know, as you know, we go into further years as well. Right, and and so and this is where I want to jump in because this is something that was very important to us. Right, like I've been to India many times myself. I have many friends who are from India, so like. It, it's it's kind of on me, like one of my roles for this is, is to have a careful eye on where our lines are when it comes to dealing with the culture. And what's really cool is you've got all these different layers in Arorsh, right? And it's like, oh, there's Arorsh that's got its monsters and its monsters are from other places. And you've got core earth. And in core earth, you have the basically the, the law of the weird, right? The, the I'm sorry, the uncanny. I can't remember what we call it now. But weird stuff exists in core earth already. And so you have you can have things like the Sasquatch or the Yeti up in you know in the Himalayas and things like that. That's like, no, no, those are part of our world. They're not part of Arorsh. And Arorsh can corrupt them just like it corrupts humans and things like that. But they're not necessarily creatures of Arorsh, but they could be like, they could, Oh, these, these are from Gaia. And this is, you know, they came from the equivalent there and being able to navigate where is this from? And is this from our folklore or something else completely alien? Or does it, it just has surface characteristics that appear like ours? It makes it a puzzle. So if you, if you know the folklore, if you've read it, you've got clues, <laughs> like what's ours and what's theirs and what's not. And if you don't, part of this is education, right? Like my hope is you'll, you'll learn, especially from the core book, some things about India. And, and the, the most important one is any generalization that you can make about India is wrong. Hmm. <laughs> <laughs> Yep. 
I have another question uh, from chat. Uh, it looks like a number of questions are coming in as well. Uh, this uh, is, uh, yeah, they are. They are loving it. Um, is there anything else you can uh, share or spoil about the prevalence of the nightmare trees in the Orosh realm? <laughs> in Orosh, we just call them trees. <laughs> <laughs> Um, well, I'll let you guys go ahead, then I've got a little bit of a teaser for something else. I'm not sure how much I'm at liberty to say. <laughs> <laughs> Spoil it! That's what people came here for! <laughs> there's, 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 <laughs> there's a possibility in the major adventure that you might learn something about the nightmare trees that is not common knowledge. That's all I'll say. John, go ahead. Well, as we all know, or most of us know, you know, nightmare trees, they're kind of covert. People are like, oh, that tree's been here all along or whatever, you know, things like that. Um, but uh, uh, there is something coming in year two that'll deal more with that in other cosms. That's all I'm going to say, though. Um, you know, I know Greg and I have to talk about that more. Hopefully Greg's not going to be like, shame on you after this, that even that's a little bit <laughs> easier. Yeah, we're uh, all going to get that. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> for me. So, uh, keep looking for that, everybody. I think there's some really cool things on the horizon uh, uh, that are with that, but it's going to be you know sometime in uh, year two. In in the core book, we specify exactly what a nightmare tree is, why it does what it does, how it works, and also how to uproot them. And I will also mention in one of the setting things that I'm writing right now. There's a uh, uh, a tourist attraction in India that it appears to be a forest, but it's actually one single tree that you know has hundreds of branches that come up in different places. You know that's going to be a nightmare tree. <laughs> <laughs> And another question from chat, chat is, um, uh, what sort of expansions to corruption can we expect? Capital C corruption. I'm curious about that myself because there's, there's some stuff I want to mess with, but, it, uh, nothing has been approved. So I really need to like, not say anything. <laughs> Ooh, I was going to say, well, off the record, cause you know, there, there's, we're not even street. We're all this friends a, here. Right? This is a private call. Friends. Like this is a secure line. It's not tapped by any governments. No, <laughs> no pressure. No pressure. Well, let me say this, right. And maybe this will influence everybody here. Right. But, um, there, there's certainly probably more to corruption that we could explore, and I, I'm, I'm leaving that to others. What I want to contribute is the idea that there may be, there may be ways to not cure it, but stay it, right, or mitigate it, like that, that, that um, kind of feeling of that again, that connection, like the idea that. That we are all we're we're in a horror cosm. Like we're all in this together. Like some of us are not going to be easy to deal with because we're in a horror cosm. But if we can find those connections that are important to us, or something that that you know we saved somebody and they're in our debt, and not only in our debt, but like they believe in us now, and maybe there's something to the fact that they can, you know, do something to help with the problem of corruption. So we can make it worse and I'm sure we will. Right. But yeah. I also kind of want to explore that aspect of it too. And that's, again, it's not set in stone. It's just something that I'm hoping for and we'll see what happens. Right. <laughs> Such that a gave me ideas of like the, uh, what was the book, the picture of uh, Dorian Gray, where you might just, Push it to the side, but it's there in the picture. Mm -hmm. It might come back. <laughs> <laughs> well, one of our common questions that we get about corruption is if you transform, does it stick with you? And so I've got a whole sidebar that says, yep, Eternal's not just a, you know, <laughs> it's not a false adjective. Like, it's it's with you forever. And uh, I I... I laugh every time people talk about charisma as a dump stat. 
And I'm like, not in a rush. Yeah. Not in a rush. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> not in a rush. Good luck, Mr. Five Charisma. <laughs> yeah. So yeah, what I wanted to see more of with corruption were and and then to me, like every time you interact with it, like there's 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 two forms that you can interact with. One is the moral dilemma, right? Like an adventure that gives you an option, whether it's power or something that you want, but the cost is, well, you gotta roll it. You could get corruption for this. That's, I mean, that's something we have a framework for, but I was like, I don't think any of the Delphi missions really engage with that, and that's fine. Like, yeah. they're only they're only so long, right? Like, um, but that's something I'd like to see engaged with more. And then the other aspect, because we don't all have time to do that, are the Cosm cards. And you know, there's going to be ten more Cosm cards, and you know, there's going to be more opportunities for us. To like put that choice in your hand and have that, okay, here's your dilemma. Now that we know learning secrets is a thing, some you know, one of the original cards is now much more important, <laughs> you know, than it used to be. And we can do other things with that, and we can trade off secrets for risking corruption. Like what's more important to you? Yeah. You know? That that's what we're trying to do a little bit. Yeah. I love the concept with the uh, the Cosm cards as they are. I was in a game um, as a game master, and he, uh, one of my players played the the card, and he was like, "Could I get this extra little something?" And I, you know, thought it's it's not quite what it says, but I'm tempting you, so yes, you know, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yes, it, it's it's not what it says. It's something extra. But if that makes you have to roll versus corruption, then then go for it. <laughs> That's what it takes to get that roll. Oh yeah, That's my, fair. my my favorite of those. Uh, it's basically a Shane Hensley trap because he has an instinct to screw his fellow players, and when he gets that damned card. Which you know, like test corruption and then steal a bunch of possibilities from someone else. Always oh, play it, and it's hilarious every single time. <laughs> Question from the chat: um, As Orosh is a very uh, quote monster-driven realm, will there be a book of monsters like the old Torg creatures of Orosh? Go ahead, Not in, I mean, they won't Dredge be Cole. for this box set. Yeah, there's, mm -hmm. yes, right. And there's a possibility the year two product line is supposed to be set in the next 30 days, and things like that are absolutely on the table. So, but I can't, even I can't answer definitively, because partly uh, Marcus has to approve year two. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, any we're doing it sort of project by project. Right. And I, and so like, this is probably a good segue, you know, and we'll probably overdo this probably should have been, we should have shot confetti out and announced this at the beginning of this <laughs> panel, but I'm going to do it right now. January 26th on game on. And we will be over the next three months trying to proclaim this everywhere. And we'll be uh, trying to do more streaming events and get the word out January 26th is going to be Orosh. And there's a couple of reasons that we were originally going to try to launch it today because we really wanted to capture Halloween uh, and all that. There were there were a couple of mitigating factors, you know, in terms of we wanted to make sure that the art was ready enough. Like we weren't worried about finishing, but we were worried about having a good looking crowdfunding you know, at the beginning, not the end. So that was one factor. And then the other factor, which I think everyone's, you know, feeling everywhere is COVID that has affected our printing schedule. And we don't like to get too far ahead of where the books are coming out, you know, so we'd be running a crowdfunding for one. And meanwhile, it's going to be at least January before Tharkold's 
arrives in print and that doesn't feel good. Like we don't like to do right. that to you. We don't like to do that to us. So we made the decision. Let's push it back to where we're more confident that Tharkhold, if it's not in your hands, it'll be on the way, you know, and we'll be able to arrive during the campaign. And that, that that's always nice. Um, and it also gives us that much more time to throw a wider net, spread the word, get people in. Next question from chat is, uh, are we getting the old miracles back? <laughs> Pillars of salt? <laughs> well, not really. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, and again, that's part of it. Is Arorsh is a project that once we started building it, the the there's a lot of stuff we want in there, and it's a 144 page book. And to get some of the other stuff, we're going to trade out. So I think the miracles may get traded out. They still might be a stretch goal. Yeah, but there will there will not be. Um, a wholesale adoption of the old tour uh, mir Sassel and miracles. Yeah. But we'll see either on the expansion or we might be able to cram a couple pages in there. Yeah. It's a, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> but I'm looking, it's going, I know there's um, part of it was th is there is a feedback process and the stuff that, you know, Tracy, and Brian were writing was like, if I wanted a tagline for Rorsch, it's sort of been morphing. <laughs> and You're welcome, Greg. <laughs> oh yeah. Oh yeah. I mean, that, that is one of the things that gets me through the week is like, Oh, okay. We're on it. That's, that's I love that. So how would I phrase that? And I don't have a good tagline yet, but it's all closest I've got is, you know, Destroying a billion people one soul at a time. <laughs> that there's a very individual level to the horror, and that there are things you want to explain of how that you can it's it's like is you know the empathy is part of it. So what are some of the personal things that happen that create the monsters and stuff? And that takes a little more setup than a stat box of a wyvern. So you just, you know, I'm, tr I want that flavor to hold for the whole book. So I'm willing to spend some time and, and sacrifice a few other things to put them to at least web extras or something, because yeah. uh, I really have liked what, what uh, Brian and Tracy are doing. And it's like, okay, I want, I want a lot of this feel for the whole book. The idea of, you know, everything from the title on of just sort of has the right focus to me. So it's like, how you can go from you know, one small thing to something that is crucial. Yeah. And it's sort of the inverse of the old Stalin, you know, thing, right? Like one man dying is a tragedy, a million is a statistic, and we go the opposite way, right? And and even in the core book, we talk about that, right? Like the very first day, there's this big wash of death and destruction. But then it slows down after that because like that set the tone. But that yeah. was never the objective. It's like, yeah. he doesn't want to kill people. He wants to scare people. He wants to scare people. Yep. Yeah. And that initial death toll is just to get people ready. <laughs> it's like, now you're listening. <laughs> yeah. And in terms of like the mechanics of it, you, you, you can't just be all horrific all the time. There has to be that sort of relief valve. There has to be sort of a normal. That's established. Yes. Otherwise, horror doesn't isn't horror anymore. It's just the normal. You get numb. You get numb. <laughs> yeah, to exactly. It. You get, yeah. yeah, exactly. You get very numb to it. You're absolutely right, Tracy. Uh, you hit the nail on the head there. Where you have to have like, where it's almost like you feel peaceful. Okay, we can kind of relax there, and then you were going to hit you again. It's like even in regular stories, you got to have comic relief or something like that uh, to uh, yeah, as you said, you know, kind of just recharge your battery almost because you're constantly on empty. Yeah, it's not going to be what we need it to be. Right, and it's almost impossible to not have comic relief in some RPG groups, and we're not going to say don't run. Don't, we're not going to say run this with your lights off and all serious all the time. That's that's not really what this is about. This is about individual sort of horror. This is about understanding that one death means something. 
and so uh, and th and that there's a regular there's a there's a there's a baseline of what life is like in Arorsh when people aren't getting killed, and it's yeah. not pretty, but it's okay. It's tolerable. It's still people yeah, are tough, it's still right? Life. Well, yeah, exactly. Because you you look at all the war torn areas in the world and how devastated they are, but people still keep going, right? Yeah. They still go to school. They still raise their kids. They still love their husbands. And all that stuff is still happening. You know. Yeah. Now there may not be tourism. <laughs> like that, that's always a thing that I watch out for when people talk about like, oh, and it's tourist bus. Or it's like, nope. Like that's not happening in Oregon anymore. Like, the situation is well beyond that. But everyday life absolutely still happens. And then you go to the horrific castle that's got the gloom, that's got every all those troops that are going to scare you, all those things that you go into a Dracula movie to see. You know, they're there, and but it's not there all the time. Like that's that's an adventure, right? Question from chat, and uh, what might be helpful to answer this is giving a care, uh, compare and contrast to maybe some of the other cosms. Uh, the question asked by Mr. Furious Triple Zero is, what does magic look like in a Roche? If someone else wants to jump in, if not, so even though the Axiom supports more magic, it tends to be a little more subtle on the outside. Like they tend to put it into items like the, like the, the Slayer's guns, alchemy, and things like that. They can still cast... And all of the more kind of ghastly base spells are thanks to Arorsh. <laughs> you know, like like the, the necromancy one that lets you talk to skulls and, and things like that. It's like, if it's like, Ugh, it's on their list, then it's probably good <laughs> for them in like, the first place, you know. Yeah. And we, we, the the okay. influence of the occult on the gear section is evident. <laughs> <laughs> and we tried to add a few more spells with that, that, that same kind of flavor, you know, right. the speak with dead where it's like, Oh yeah, that's an error spell for sure. Gotcha. Yeah. <laughs> I got to do what to who now to cast this. All right. <laughs> <laughs> so it looks like those are all of our chat based questions and you guys have almost come up to an hour, but we're not quite there. So uh, the chat said they'd like to see a wrestling match done virtually for the remainder. I'm just kidding. Um, so <laughs> well, but, hey, let, let me take a minute. Let, let me take a minute though, because I got to do this like every like half an hour or so to make sure people know if you are watching this, send a whisper to Eric Torg or treat Torg or treat to him. If you send him Torg or treat, we, he will send you a link to our download, you know, that's our treat, right? Like your, your candy bag, it's going to have five threat cards from the three months away, you know, crowdfunding. It's got the four Gospog and the God man with their art and everything ready to play. So if you want to add some monsters to your game right now, Torg or treat to Eric. Yeah. All right. So about that wrestling match. No, I'm kidding. Um, <laughs> do, do mention, Eric. I got I, this. Let's do this. Let's do this. Wait. I'm looking at John going, oh, wait, never mind. <laughs> so in our tour campaign on WebDM, uh, we're getting ready to go to Arosh, which we're very excited for. We're visiting all the different cosms and um, – uh, You're excited for that, you poor bastard. <laughs> well, I, I get to be the we producer. Have whole, we have whole pages saying, like, you know, okay, so – Watch out! I'm not. I'm not a player. I'm a producer. This is me just sitting back and watching them suffer. Um, so, as all producers do, it's like yes, meet your deadlines, deliver, gobble gobble. Um, no, I'm excited. Yeah, but uh, I was going to say. So our campaign is set. Uh, we're doing Torg in the 1980s. So it's 1987. I saw that. Yeah, in yeah. the um, uh, one of our one of our characters is a professional wrestler. Uh, and American yep. Gladiator, um, who will be back this week, by the way. Uh, but uh, let's let's dive into some more general questions. So, what are some of the biggest differences uh, between Orosh in original Torg versus Orosh today? Um, yeah. How would it, and there may be a lot, but if what what would be some key flagship differences, if there are? 
Yeah, well, so one of the flagship differences is mechanically how we treat it. Like in the old one where they had perseverance, like our, and even in the, the core book, the, the law of perseverance basically is uh, normally in, re, in, all, in every other cosm when you spend a possibility to soak, if you succeed, you're getting rid of a wound and all the shock. In a Rorsch, not so much. A success gets rid of the shock, but not the wound. And that means you got to roll at least five or ten better, you know, than you normally would have to to mitigate wound damage at all. And that makes heroes significantly less invincible. So when you're in action movie mode and you're like, yeah, I'm in the Nile Empire, I can do anything. And then you cross <laughs> over into horror mode and you're like, oh, my God, that werewolf just tore my guts out and they stayed coming out. What happens to me? You know, and that was very purposefully done. And, and it, it was almost how we did the base rule. And we decided it, it didn't feel heroic enough for the regular game, but it was it was on the table. And then you said, Arorsh is the place to do this. Like this, this feels right for, for them. And it, it raises the stakes when you're battling monsters on their home turf. They're that much more sort of frightening. And, and that's one of the, yeah, yeah it, it is. And because you got, you know, so one of my favorite like twists on the horror movie genre of all time is Aliens, the movie. Because like Aliens, a great horror movie. And like the crew is stuck and all that. But in Aliens, you establish these guys are awesome. They've got really powerful weapons. They're really good at their jobs. They're badasses and you love them. And they can fight the monsters, but they're still in over their heads. And so you still get like, oh man, this is a terrible situation. But like it feels so much more heightened because both sides are more powerful. And that's what... That's the feeling I want with a Rorsch, usually, when it plays. Yeah, the, kind of the point is not to kill the heroes. The point is to scare the heroes. The point <laughs> is to make you think twice about fighting that particular horror that you've just come in contact with. Or to plan out how you're going to take down this nightmare that you're hunting. Without going in just guns a-blazing and assuming you're in the Nile Empire. Like, that's the point of it. Or lure him to the Nile Empire. It's a rematch. Oh, there you go. Good luck. <laughs> sure. <laughs> I always like ex explaining the law of uh, perseverance to my players because they're like, oh, that law sucks. And I was like, no, it's good because without it, you wouldn't heal anything. <laughs> exactly. Without it, you couldn't soak it all. <laughs> uh, it's funny you sent mentioned that I'm in my, uh, my group when I did my play test for the Delphi mission. Like they hadn't gone through a Rorschach. They're like, seriously, it's one of the world laws. Like, yep, yeah, it's gonna be a little tougher. <laughs> as as Daryl, you know, just described, it's actually really tough to, uh, uh, you know, harm a storm knight a lot of times in general, unless they become disconnected. That's the only time I've had somebody actually die in a Torg game, uh, Torg Eternity game. Uh, uh, but, uh, you know, in a Rorsch, yep, that changed it quite a bit, which, in my opinion, adds to that kind of fear. Like, you're like, oh man, I'm not completely invulnerable, you know? And, and why there's that, that kind of sense of dread around going to a Rorsch. Like, you know, that's the, oh, man, it got serious. <laughs> like, we've got to yeah. go there. <laughs> and we even, you know, we, we, we sort of not, not suggest, but like option on the table. Maybe you don't want to bring your beta level, latest clearance storm night into a Rorsch just <laughs> going in right maybe you want to create an alpha level storm night and do it that way maybe and, and you don't have to but and and it's certainly like it's 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 not like we're gonna we're out to kill your characters but at the same time it's very possible you, we could kill your characters so that's that's what a rorsch is it it, it 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 the whole point of being afraid to go in is what we want right yeah. or worse we won't kill you we'll make you a bad guy Oh well, yeah, we'll corrupt you. That's way worse. Way worse. Go in with your five charisma. <laughs> Andy's really powerful, you say? Tell me more. <laughs> Twarik, come here, my friend. <laughs> yeah. So unfortunately, we are at time for this uh, panel. 
Um, but remember that working tagline that, uh, uh, what was that again, Greg? Uh, the tagline for Arosh was really clever. Destroying a billion people one soul at a time. Nice. <laughs> thank you I feel so chills because, uh. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, Thank you so much, chat, for your question. Sorry we couldn't get to all of them. Um, but what we're going to do is we're going to set up for an Arosh encounter that's uh, forthcoming. And that'll be the next leg. So don't go away. Uh, we're going to play some of our interlude music uh, while we uh, put up the interstitial graphic. And uh, stand by.
muted. Hello, everybody. Hello. It's muted and it's Hello. unmuted now. Hey, everyone. Hello, everybody. Hello. We are back with the gang, our illustrious uh, panelists, now Storm Knights, for a tour. Ill and illustrious. <laughs> <laughs> deathly Please. ill, as my child described as our neighbors to date. We are all deathly ill over here, he said. And I was like, wow, <laughs> that's my kid. Um, but yeah, so I'm going to turn it over to uh, uh, Grandmaster Game Master Greg Gordon uh, to kick off this encounter. Uh, thank you for joining us. I appreciate the player's patience as we, uh, you know, cobble together this thing. But it'll be an extended Arosh encounter. So I'd like to set the scene that the audience sees a camera focusing on the glass pane panel of a grandfather clock that is just ticking back and forth as you hear breakage of like a computer screen, you hear a scuffle in the background, and then a, a shot rings out, you hear a thump. A little while later, you hear a second shot. Blood splatters on the pendulum pane. Mm. Then one drop of blood goes up pain to the clock face and then from off screen an opera gloved hand sets the minute hand of the clock from three to four scene shifts it's a train station on the outskirts of Hyderabad India it's an old coal powered locomotive chugging up along the lines Comes to a stop at the station, steam billowing everywhere, and the first to step off the train is Tracy. So describe your character. I am playing Anisha, the Relic Raider, and I was into, I'm from India, and I was into archaeology before this whole mess happened. And then the invasion uh, took place, and now I'm still into, well, sort of a different version of archaeology i really lo do love to to hunt eternity shards um but along the way i'm actually you know trying to save the world so um i've hooked up with these people and apparently i'm on a train in a Rorsch, and it is unpleasant here and it is not the place that i grew up in it is not and you see anisha hears her name called yeah, shifts to you see a man windbreaker waving his hand clearly you know still core earth and he apparently is your contact but then we go back to lehman describe yourself as you get off the train i anton brutal siberian <laughs> um big burly uh from tharkold with a cult tech arm and a big uh hammer hammer <laughs> <laughs> In search of nails. I mean, that hammer is cool. impressive. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, if we need to build a house, you'll be the first one we call. <laughs> <laughs> so, John, you step off next. Yes. Yeah, so, a uh, um, <clears throat> a man uh, uh, cloaked in a, a mask and uh, well, a shroud around him with tattered. It's red. Um, known as the Shroud, uh, a hero from the Nile Empire. Um, <clears throat> very serious man. Doesn't speak much, but when he does, he's very direct and to the point. And there's something about his mask. When he wants to, he can see the, the worst fears and most and intimidate many of his opponents, which he usually does. Daryl? Uh, this is Thomas Brownstone. He talks like this because part of his throat got ripped out by a werewolf. But, you know, he won out on that one, and he's now wearing that critter as a coat, you know, which provides <laughs> extra protection and irritates werewolves, both of which are things that he likes. He's got his special equipment, and he is a, a, a monster hunter back from Victorian Gaia. I'm ready for it. So the windbreakered man comes up, extends his hand out to Anisha. Says, Hello, I'm Ravi Bhutaprali. Thank, thank you for coming on such short notice. We, um, uh, the, the station's a mess. Um, of course. We, tele of course. We, we telegraphed the council 
and we know what the source of the problem is just we can't do anything about it i'm just happy i got to sit in a chair rather than on top of the box car <laughs> <laughs> oh uh well we got you second class tickets that's the i'm sorry that's the best we could do and so don't, he starts, don't mind him <laughs> he starts, he's just a grump it is uh, second class that is luxury <laughs> <laughs> Soviet Russia box car rides you. <laughs> Ignoring the, the the banter and some of the stilliness, the very serious shroud says, "What is the problem?" <laughs> yes, yes, um, the problem. We need to discuss the problem. I it, it's clearly some sort of demonic possession, but well, anyway, I'll show you the station or what's left of it. So, you walk about half a mile. He undoes a padlock at a fairly, you know, plain looking storage unit. You know, it's got, it's, it's a, obviously a core earth building that's transformed because the shapes of the windows and stuff are wrong, but it's now back to, it's now about your brick iron trim. He opens it up and you still see that there's blood on the walls and he goes, um, points towards the center of the back wall is that points at a clock grandfather clock says it's in there uh we've dynamited this thing to splinters we burned it we took a train about a day south dropped in the ocean chopped it to kindling We just lost you, Greg. We lost your volume. And there's something in there that possesses people. Wait, you says it possesses people? So I've heard all these tales about you trying to wreck it. What's this about possessing? Possessing people. Because there's something inside we detect. In fact, Lady Elstone brought the clock in because she suspected it was evil. So... And uh, it quickly confirmed itself. <laughs> yes. Um, so Director Dodd, um, Station Director Dodd, he's dead. One of the Robertson Brigade, the uh, sort of local vigilantes, was possessed. Came in, killed him, and then shot himself. And we've heard of other such deaths around town. And we just can't get rid of this thing. So who is this Elstone that brought this thing in here? Uh, Lady Elstone. Uh, she lives. She lives upwind of the factories, and you probably want a cab. I can get you a carriage to get there. Yeah, I think we should probably talk to her. Yeah. yeah. Just being around it possesses people. I think. Oh uh, well, he's dead. But Dodd explained it to me that this anchors this thing and it can possess people within a certain range and if we could somehow get rid of the clock we'd probably get rid of it but no it's not just limited to the station i mean it possessed robertson robertson lives a good two kilometers from here wow and every way you've tried to destroy it it just reappears it reappears here yes always here and it doesn't take very long it's never taken more than a day often it takes less Hmm. Well, just because I can't resist, uh, I will actually like approach the clock and mm -hmm. just give it a look and see what I see. I mean, if there's nothing to see, that's fine. I just, I, I, I want to, I want to look at it. Would you like to apply any particular skill to this observation? I mean, I would take a find roll if you were going to give it to me. I would absolutely give you a find roll. Okay, dokie. A little bit behind her just to protect and do the same as well using fine. I'll All get right. ready to shoot them both when they're possessed. Yes, you get ready. To <laughs> <laughs> I'm gonna roll my thing here. All right, so I got a three bonus, so that makes gets gets me a 14 on my find roll. Okay, it's you know, I got less. If than eight. you were at all observant, you can tell that. There is something wrong. I'm assuming that find and evidence analysis and things like that 
help you find corrupted objects because in a Rorsch, they don't exactly hide. So you could tell, yeah, this thing's been touched by you know, corruption of some kind. And there's, but yeah, I have a 14. So that's about what you can get. It's, it's definitely corrupted. It is native to a native to a Rorsch, but you would say it's probably not anymore. It was, Ooh. it was here and now it's kind of in between here and somewhere else. Okay. Well, I'll pass that along. Like, I, I don't know how I know exactly, but it seems like this is, this is tr transformed in a strange way. It's not totally a Rorsch, but it used to be. I mean, like yeah. that feeling you get when you cross from one zone to another and you know reality shifted. It's that kind of feeling. Exactly. It's that kind of yeah. feeling. I hate that feeling. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I'm not a big fan of it either. So, Bad Shroud, feeling. You said, Shroud, you said you were doing something? I was doing the same thing. I got an eight, so okay. I'm not sure I didn't get any more. Sure it's, it's impeccable craftsmanship. <laughs> hey, like there's blood on it. <laughs> <laughs> so, but it, it looks just like an ordinary grandfather clock, right? Yeah. Um, it It's high quality. I mean, it's expensive, obviously, but yeah, it looks like an ordinary grandfather clock. So, and this is going to be like the the stupid Victorian question, right? So, these old <laughs> clocks, they're usually run by a counterweighting system you know, or something mechanical that's providing the yeah. energy, whether it's a wind-up yes. or weights or whatever. Is that, like, obviously true for this one? And he'll ask, like, is anyone, like, like winding, you know, moving the weights and resetting it? Or is it just go on its own? Or does it okay. go at all? So, uh, so you want to try to make a find or you have some other skill you'd like to apply to that? Uh, I mean, I it, it's, it. obviously, it's obviously running. It does have I mean, a counterweight system, but. I'm going to use my persuasion and ask the guy, like, if somebody <laughs> wants that thing up. <laughs> I'm not um, touching that thing. Uh, yeah. After, you said, yeah, like, after, after, after the like, first death. Uh, no, nobody has. I mean, the only time is when we, and we have, we, <laughs> We actually start using tongs to try to move it um, in case contact was, it was driving energy from us in some way. Um, but it, it, it's always running, except as you can notice, the minute hands don't move, but they move every once in a while and always in hour increments. Mm. I don't like it. I haven't seen anybody uh, wind it. So it doesn't keep track of normal time is what you're telling me. The hours are correct. I can't tell you about the second hands, but the minute hands don't move. The minute hand does not move. Okay. That's really peculiar. Yes. But then which again, is why this we, is we assume that it has to have some sort of occult mechanism because you look inside, the gearing has the seconds gear, the minutes gear, the hours gear, the counterweights are appropriately balanced to that. There's no reason the minute hand shouldn't. It's just not. And the person that we're trying, that we might want to talk to, what was their connection again with this? Uh, they uh, donated. They, oh, they recognized... Yeah. Yeah, they recognize this. Uh, they called it a haunted object. She called it. A, Lady Elstone called it haunted, and um, was hoping we could, you know, exercise it or dispose of it. Well, well I want to talk to her. She's the first person we've heard of that could actually get rid of this thing. <laughs> <laughs> well, I know how to talk his words. Yeah. So that's um. Yeah, but I I'm. I, I'm so thankful you're here. I'm completely at my wit's end. We shut the station house down, sent the other, you know, assets here. I still come in to try to run the, you know, continue working on the Babbage engine in the basement. But I really haven't. I mean, I'm terrified every time I hear the thing chime. So um, I'm not. I'm not making much progress. Well, we'll do our best, Ravi. Thank you. Thank you. Don't thank us till we actually done something. That's fair. 
Well, <laughs> you came. That's the first positive thing that's happened in the last month. So I truly appreciate it. Um, I can I can grab you a, a handsome if you want to go to Lady Ellsworth. Well, that would be great. Right, thank you. All right. So you first time anyone called me handsome in about thirty years. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, we just we just segue to you pulling up to. Okay, this thing you're guessing was like an IT office building because it still has it still has the frosted glass doors on the outside, and that's the only thing left. Everything else has now been transformed into marble porticos, so it looks you know fairly impressive. And the cab driver you know nods as you exit, and so somebody gonna tip that feller. <laughs> and the cat driver just says uh she's kind of peculiar so um don't don't spend a lot of time around her that's just just from what i heard the robertson's brigade doesn't like her at all and well of course i'm not a super fan of the robertson's brigade but you know they're they're useful at times So, going up and uh, the yeah, we'll move of, up. Yeah, the anachronistic thing of you've got frosted glass door that somehow won't open with an old-fashioned knocker on a frosted glass door. I'll knock. Don't break it. <laughs> and a uh, coat and tailed manservant opens up the door and says, "Um." The lady isn't expecting guests. Who, may I say, has arrived? Um, we're an interested party uh, from the uh, the place where you donated the, well, your mistress, perhaps, donated the grandfather clock. And we, we would like to ask her some questions about that clock. Oh. Please I mean, her, her goal was to sort of, you know, um, depossess it, and we, we, we may need some more information. Right. Um, I won't be long. Just the door. You hear a click. Anton. Back about. <laughs> hey, Anton, make sure no one runs out the back. <laughs> <laughs> Good thinking. Good thinking. <laughs> <laughs> so are you are you going to circle, I'll, I'll, circle I'll, around? I'll, I'll, yeah, I'll go around the back. Yeah, you know, like these heavy footsteps. <laughs> yeah, you get to the point where clearly the, the privacy is maintained by a thick hedgerow. I mean, you could spend a round or two plowing through it, but this is this is clearly a sign of polite, gentle people don't pass this point. Oh, I'll, I'll just barge right through. <laughs> That's why we said it. <laughs> okay, go. go ahead and go ahead and. Give me your give me your melee roll. Okay. Oh, that wasn't too good. <laughs> Seven. Every, every card and a possibility you have. <laughs> Eat the shrub. Yeah, you're like you get you you get about four feet in. You hadn't realized that you know this thing's like twelve feet thick, and so you're like, oops. You you are caught in it. Do you want to spend you spend a possibility on that thing? Sure, why not? <laughs> ah, I got better than a ten. So in one reality, so five, Anton is entirely so embarrassed. Sixteen. <laughs> oh, nice. Okay, yeah. So, so you, yes. <laughs> you know, you you sort of explode through like the Kool Aid Man. I mean, there are <laughs> leaves and boughs everywhere as you like, come through because you are just. <laughs> Yeah. Oh, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and there are you startle two maids who are like setting up lemonade <laughs> like oh ah ah and then you see one of the, the men servants like um he's allowed we expected him to come through the usual entrance but uh just have what's your name sir i anton uh, uh, uh mr anton if you could just have a have a seat and uh, 
maybe a sip of cool lemonade and uh, we'll, we'll, the lady will be out shortly and I'll go get the rest of your friends and oh, the gardener. Sure. So look at the hedge. Oh, dear. <laughs> um, I keep you with work, with job. <laughs> sure, um, it's really a good Samaritan. Yeah. <laughs> so, so the original man sort of opens up the door and says, yes, the lady will uh, meet you in the garden. And she's just um, preparing herself. So they lead you back to the house. <laughs> and it's um, it's clear about half this house is used. The other half is still under sheets. And so you go back out in this, the bright sunlight of the garden. And hey, Anton's already there. <laughs> <laughs> Lemonade, good. So It is good. Lemony. That's <laughs> right. And so the two maids stand back and just almost look like guards at attention. And then they, the men sort of pull out seats for you, seat you at the table. And then oh, you, see Lee, <laughs> you see Lady Elstone leave. So make a find roll as Lady Elstone comes out. Everybody? Um, everybody. Giant D20 of danger. D20 of danger. I have a Torg D20. Thank you very much. Oh, I know. I've got one of those, too. I'm so I excited. A 10. Okay. I got a 10 as well. That's a 10 for me, too. I got an 11. Okay. Nine. Okay. <laughs> so we're solid. But the... Mediocre is what we are. Yeah. Ten's good. Um, yeah. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, 11. You're so close to a 12. But, <laughs> so, yeah. The, not close the, enough. The bustle. I can put you this, this much you can tell. The bustle, corset, straight Victorian. Her walk seems off for a lady of a Rorsch. Mm. Just doesn't feel right. And so they come and they, they seat her down. And she's got this wide brimmed hat, you know, shade her from the sun. She looks at you and says, Storm Knights, I presume? Well, mm. there's no I'm point not. in denying it, I don't think. <laughs> well, no, I. I Good. Uh, I'm sorry about the mess at the station house. I I didn't I I knew things would be bad. I didn't know they'd be that bad. Yes, you look a sorry. A mess I'm is sorry. an understatement. People are dead. If you might have noticed uh, death is a little more common now. I was hoping to prevent something perhaps even worse, but I don't. Um, appears I failed in that as well. Well, can you give us a little bit more information on what worse you feared? Somebody who wants to make a persuasion test is see how how revealing or come up with a line to, to convince her about how how much detail is she going to go into could we have shroud use interrogate let's use a intimidate <laughs> interrogator instead <laughs> um, <Mean it>. oh, <laughs> <laughs> okay you can her willpower is 13 all right give me a second then yeah i turn on the whole interrogation mode <laughs> and give give me a Save solid her. line Switching gears. Yeah, right. to go. Exactly. I'm, I'm, I'm trying to be nice, but Shroud just steps right in. Like, yeah, I, I actually <laughs> step in front of her and say, look, if you want us to help, you need to tell us the truth. We can mitigate whatever might have gone on if there was anything unusual and nefarious going on. And I got a 20, actually. Wow. Oh, wow. So, yeah. Well, the well, Shroud is terrifying. Second roll. <laughs> I, mean, I use my mask, the embodiment of it. It maybe, maybe it glows, maybe it doesn't. When I say this, mm -hmm. and she looks you straight in the eyes and says, "It's almost like being home." Ah. If she could so, see my eyebrow row raised behind the mask, it, she would, but she didn't. Yeah. So, I believe this 
is connected with my return. Last I remember, I was crashing into a Russian mountain in a helicopter. Then well, I common woke... occurrence. <laughs> yes. Then I woke up here. And things, bad things have been happening. And I can tell there's, how would I describe, a pressure every day and every night wanting me to do things that don't seem terribly wrong, but I think I am being prepared to be an agent for an evil I'd rather not serve. What I sorts think of it's... Hmm? Sorry, I mean an upgrade. What sorts of things have you been urged and compelled to do? Oh, I... I donated some of the family items to a uh, girl's school. And I've donated the clock to the station. <laughs> Neither of which have worked out well. So you uh, were on a plane and you maybe crashed, but woke up here? Yes. And... You're the lady of the manor, I see. Is that right? Servants, am, all that? I'm Lady Elstone, though that was not my name before I hit the helicopter. Oh. <laughs> and it's taunting me because it's related, and I just can't figure out how. Do you it's have like memories? I, I'm of, oh, sorry. I, I, I'm being converted. Absolutely. I see. And do you have memories of your life here? Or did you wake up and... Oh, no. I, I, I woke up alone. And then later that day, first thing that was odd is servants came in. Knowing that they had worked for me, but didn't know who I was. The household sort of populated itself. Again, hmm. it's, it's all... And this is strictly my intuition. The reason I thought the clock was at the center of it is how precise and regular every little intervention seems to be. It's just like tick tock, tick tock, this, this, then this, then this, and it's not leading to anywhere good. Um, so Lady Yellowstone, as she is now... El, it's, not, it's just Elstone. Just Elstone, I'm sorry. Did yep. not exist before you arrived? Is that what your feeling is? Well, the, the neighbors... The house has just been abandoned since basically day two. And it had no historic meaning in the town. It was just an office complex. Got transferred into this, and all of a sudden I'm Lady Elstone. But after a few days of being Lady Elstone, there like appeared an article in the society column about my charitable works. <laughs> 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 and then I felt compelled to donate to the girls' school. Who were you before the Lady Elstone? I don't completely recall. But my guess is... Mr. Shroud, you and I were on opposite sides. Hmm. Anything new appeared in your place recently? After... <sighs> the most recent is the death of the station chief. Killed with weapons... <laughs> purchased by my donation to the Robertson Brigade. So, I really don't want to know what's next. Well, I think we do. I think that's the only way we're going to get ahead of it. Yeah. Maybe we'll get lucky and a diary is going to appear one of these days. 
<laughs> My thing is, I know, I know there's an entity inside that cloud. Because every time an action, a significant action occurs, I'm compelled to go to the clock and I move its minute hand to the next hour. I've done this. It's, when I first arrived, it was at one. And through the th three deaths so far, I've moved it once each. Or three, how do you, how do you get in? <laughs> how do I get into the station? Yes. So she says, would you mind just following me inside? For a second okay so she walks inside and she asks one of the men some um please lock and bolt the library and so they go and about a minute and a half later they come back and bow and she walks up to the door the lock goes falls off doors open if this is on my allowed path Obstacles are simply removed. If it's not on my allowed path, there's nothing I can do. I tried to buy bread from a local food cart. Could not pull the money out of my purse. Could not find the words. But if it's on my approved path, <sighs> no obstacle gets in my way. Lady, remind me not to be an obstacle for you. <laughs> <laughs> Huh. So you are like robots. Um, yes, it feels like I'm some weird science automata sometimes. And as long as I keep moving along the approved paths, my <laughs> my course will end up somewhere pretty horrible. I don't have all I all the only idea I have is to see what she does next because um, I don't have an idea for what to investigate do you guys well I think we should have the shroud ask a couple questions of that head butler he might know more than she does well, first I want to know more about the clock you said it was you know, how did you come into possession of it for, at first it was in the hall within a day or two of my arrival. And then you were compelled to donate it. That was your approved path. Yes. First, I was compelled to donate some items to the, from the library to the girls' school. Mm, then, I was compelled, then I was compelled to donate funds to the Robertson's Brigade. Then I was compelled to take the clock into the station. So, Greg, I'm going to go ahead and play a card. Um, I'm going to go ahead and play a connection. You hear or know someone in the area who can lend aid? <clears throat> so, what type of aid are you looking for? It's <sighs> a good question. Um, more of Con where connection at the girls' school, maybe? Or well, I don't know. Not with I'm you, maybe. With the well, clock. maybe. How the clock came to like be here, maybe. Um, you know, the shroud would know somebody being an investigator. Um, maybe he would know somebody to get him in contact with. Uh, you know, the uh, like an an antique expert or something like that. Since this is a very old clock and very well made, it might have a uh, uh, some way to track it. You know, it's yeah. too it just right. have to out of existed more than two days ago. Yeah. <laughs> well, we'll just say we'll just say that you you happen to know a a weird scientist who has um, decided to relocate to avoid uh, your kind, but it's not that he's a bad fellow. He just doesn't understand that there are things you shouldn't uh, you shouldn't be building. Whereas he is, if you can build it, build it. So I will go grab a guy from up here from my random list. Okay. All right. So you know a Linda Mason, who's a pretty accomplished, a pretty accomplished uh, weird scientist. Okay. I relay this information to the rest of the group, but 
don't you know part ways right now. I would like to, as Mr. Brownstone pointed out, speak with your your butler. All right. So uh, she's like, certainly. So yeah, the butler's there, to, like polishing silver. May I help you? Yes, we were curious how you came into the ladies' employ. Well, that's simply unacceptable. Oh, I'm sorry. One second. All right. Uh, well, I've always worked for the lady. I mean, years. How long has it been since you said it was around day two, roughly, is what she described? I mean, how long is this? How much time has elapsed since day one? Since she first showed up, she tells you it's been about five weeks. Okay, gotcha. Not quite. Events seem to happen about every seven to eight days. Uh, does it seem like he's lying? Mm. No ish. <laughs> oh. How did I mean, this... he's. I it's, just kind of. Also... Go ahead. Sorry. Go ahead. Uh, no, I was saying. Um, uh, I just kind of take that, make a mental note of it, and uh, continue on the the clock, the grandfather clock that was here. Yeah. The lady donated. Yes. How did it arrive? So now he's got to make a roll because you, you're creating cognitive dissonance. <laughs> it. It's not from here, which is impossible. Everything's from here, but it's not from here. Where is it from? I don't know. I thought everything had been here the whole time, but I think you're right. I think it's from somewhere else, but that doesn't feel right. Everything is telling me that he's talking and all of a sudden you see his eyes start doing. And he says, it's always been here. Mm. So when he's doing that, you know, I, and we're storm nights, right? We've all disconnected and had those moments and we do it on purpose. Can we feel energy like that when his eyes are, are, are flipping around? Make a reality roll. Awesome. Big old, oh, 20 explodes. There you go. It's a 34. Oh, man. Just covered up the thing. 34, that's plus 10. That's a 21. Wow. Yes, absolutely. He's reconnecting to something that that the shroud caused him to disconnect from. And it is not from here. Awesome. Uh, I'm like, yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll mention that to everybody. It's like, you know that feeling? Like, <laughs> you know, <laughs> yeah, on. But, yeah, like, I felt that from him. That's what's going yeah. on. Yeah, whatever he's connected to it and Absolutely. local. And it's um yeah, you now know you now know what that feels like. So you can use reality and investigate other objects and see if they have like a similar frequency. So you can detect that. Ooh. I'm gonna do, do a little we... tracking. You wanna do some tracking? I do. Let's do some tracking. All right, so what are you gonna track? Uh so for, I'm just I'm thinking first I'll move around the house while they're asking doing whatever and see if there's any items that are particularly you know have that wavelength very strongly you know and if, if they're you know if they look cursed or it's like oh look there's the voodoo doll in the corner I'm like, yeah. <laughs> yeah yeah okay <laughs> oh woo yeah let's see e is uh Almost spend a possibility. I want this to go off. Clunk, clunk. So it turns it to an 18.5. That's tracking 14. And I'm going to spend a willpower card to boot to kick that up to a 17. 
Okay, so there isn't a significant item, but your guess is if you take a look at how the staff look mm -hmm. and sort of the, the aura, if you will, that they have, you're guessing something is working very actively on Lady Els. And if you sort of compare where the trails are coming from, you guess, yeah, it's probably coming from the station. I'll mention that. Well, that confirms some things. Well, should we huh. head that way then? We could speak of the mad scientist. I know that I could convince to aid us on the way. Well, we got to watch out for that in their girls' school. <laughs> yeah, we, I'm curious of what she donated to the girls' school. Documents I'll, from the library. I'll have an a couple ask books. Her, a couple of books, that, yeah. A couple of books and some uh, letters that supposedly are for, from my family, but I don't remember having a family. We would so, probably want to read those letters, yeah. Probably. Yeah. That could be important. Well, <laughs> it could be important. <laughs> what unusual has happened at the girls' school since you donated these items? And besides the Robertson Brigade tossing one of them in the river to drown the demon <laughs> demon conjurer? Um, I don't know. But I know <laughs> something bad happened after I donated. I'm withholding judgment on whether that would be a good thing or a bad thing. <laughs> <laughs> may have may have drowned a witch or two myself. <laughs> All right. So I think the next step we're going to go head to the school. I think you so. Go or do you and, want your? I mean, you, you could go to, talk to your contact. You yeah, talk I'll to your talk contact. To my contact on the way. Yeah. Um. So, yeah. So you could you call and you just you know where he lives. Or where she lives, and you get there, and it's like it's like going to an automobile junkyard, but everything's brass. <laughs> yeah. And you see, you, you can smell the gas from whatever torch apparatus she has. Like she flips up the shield, shroud. I, I have. I have teleported nothing out of any financial institution <laughs> since You'll worry I've arrived. Well, I'm, not, I'm not here for that. I did tell you I would call oh, on you for... Then I've never teleported anything out of any financial institution. <laughs> Mental <laughs> note. <laughs> Might um, need to talk to her later. <laughs> I need your help. Huh. Oh, you there's, came a long way to get my help. I was already here. There are things going on here that are strange. You're familiar with uh, the lady... Uh, God, what was her name again? L. Uh, Elstone. Elstone. Yeah, Elstone. Uh, can't, can't say I am. That, that sounds like somebody on a society page. I don't read those. Well, the lady Elstone is someone that has come here within the past little over a month, though she recalls always being here. There's been huh. strange going-ons with objects she's donated from her estate to a girl's school, and then another establishment as well. Wait, 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 whoa, 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 wait, wait. She's been here a month, but she's not from here, and she's donating objects. Have you analyzed any one of these objects? Not entirely, no. That's what I was hoping you could help me with. Analyze. Yes, 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 yes. That yes, yes, seems yes. like a, something you do. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, uh, yeah, I, yes, absolutely. Do you, do, you, do you have one I could analyze? Yes, we can get you to one. Excellent. Let me, let me pack a trunk. Okay. So do we want to take him or take her to the clock or the girls school? What do you guys think? Well, I think we should warn her that many that have analyzed this thing have ended up dead. <laughs> 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 <clears throat> All right. Um, well, I will uh, inform her of the dangers that people that have been around it. Well, not even around it. 
Um, but uh, there have been people that have interacted with it or near it or well, not even yes, that yes, close. Yes, yes, yes. Uh, progress, progress always involves danger. Blah, 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 blah. Okay. So let's, let's, uh, you, you can take me to one of these. That sounds like informed consent. <laughs> <laughs> Yes. Well, uh, if nobody says otherwise, uh, I'll uh, take her to the clock. So her trunk is about eight feet long, four feet wide. You have to get a cab just for it. But oh, she's no, we've got, got, got Anton. You can carry that. Yeah, she's got like <laughs> a traveling. <laughs> so, yeah, Anton can help her lead this thing off. <laughs> Pick up the trunk. <laughs> yeah. And so she just starts by, yes, I've heard, I've heard of these things before, uh, sort of phenomena that are that are from other places that are arriving all over India, but I've never seen one up close. And, she, oh, is that it? She points to the clock. You're about to get closer yes. than you want to. <laughs> be, care, be careful. I would stand is, by to aid you. It is first oh, time, maybe last time. Okay. <laughs> My my understanding of these things is they probably have a guardian entity of some kind. So if I'm working on that, it might come out and try to stop me. So if you could stop it from stopping me, that would be excellent. Good to know. Good, good to know. <laughs> Thanks for the yeah. heads up. Yep. Absolutely. And she pulls out this thing that sort of looks like a kaleidoscope. And uh, apparently she's diverge from the path of science a little bit because <laughs> those are runes or sigils or something uh, that she's inscribed on the lens and she's like humming a happy oh. tune oh that's <laughs> science i know science and that's science <laughs> yes that, it's absolutely <laughs> science that is absolutely science all righty so let's Pick a drama card. <laughs> <laughs> Look, a guardian. <laughs> the battle is mine. And villains go first, and they're inspired. Oh, goody. <laughs> Yay. All right. Well, that's a fine how do you do. So... What is your reality there, Mr. Monster Hunter? Uh, mine? The reality is 11 Zs. Ooh. Ooh. Okay, so I will spend. Oh. So that's plus nine. I like plus nine. Yeah. Okay. Oh, I don't know. <laughs> so she starts attaching that sort of look like, you know, like she's giving the, the clock an EKG. <laughs> With stickers and wires leading to the stuff and putting the kaleidoscope looking thing about a meter in front of the, in front of the clock. And as she gets a couple of these attached. You see the monster hunter go like rigid and then fade out. Uh, <laughs> so like he's disconnected the trapping kind of thing. Does that like look like the start of it? It looks, um, everybody make a reality roll. Okay. Nope. <laughs> Shroud? I got a four, by the way. Okay. Sorry. I didn't realize I was on mute, but uh, yeah, I nailed it. I got a 21. Oh, look okay. At you. I hope I nailed it. I didn't. Screw it. I had so a 10. Anyway. Ten, like, okay, uh, ten, off the wall ten will do question. it. Off the wall question. I can't remember if Anisha's got the uh, the uh, indomitable. I think it is where she gets to reroll reality for soaking. And if she uh, that's does... testing soak is favored, and then uh, indomitable is testing for active defense is favored. Yeah. So, but testing. So I don't think this counts for soaking. But I'm going to ask Greg if this is a favored role for Anisha because of that. No, it's 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 not affecting them at all. Okay. They're basically yeah. figuring out what happened to you. Yeah. Sure. Legit. Yeah. yeah. So um Aunt Anton would figure that this is kind of like an invoked reality storm. Ooh. And whoa. The, the shroud <laughs> the shroud takes a further nuance to say it's something that sort of 
shifted him one half reality over and locked him in. So the monster hunter isn't there. And then it looks like the old photograph of Station Chief Dodd, except it's like he's the cupcake mold and there's an overstuffed <laughs> something that's been poured into him. And he sort of puts himself together and says, so sorry, chap, you're next. Is this to me? Yeah, to you. Awesome. Oh, I just get this big grin on my face and go, <laughs> monster, come get my gun out of here. You picked the wrong guy. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So that's, so that's, uh, that's, Basically, a missile attack of 18. Uh, that's going to be a good hit against me. All right. Ow! <sighs> Stop it! <laughs> <laughs> okay, so that's 25 damage. Okay, so let's oh, go. Alright, well, I'm done this 11, that's 14, so that's two wounds. I'll definitely attempt to soak. Yep. And let's, let's hope that this goes well. <laughs> you just died. You sit the 20. Oh, that's so lucky. 13, 33. That's. 10, that's a 21. That soaks two wounds in all shock, even in a roll. <sighs> oh, yeah! <laughs> so for, the effect is, for a brief moment, there are about a, there are about 12 monster hunters. You're, like, you're just split out, like you've prismed out. And then you're trying to select this one, and it's modifying your choice to the one at the other end. You're being fought over this, and it slides to your choice, and you absorb the damage. You soak awesome. the damage. Okay. All right. People, people still outside where the clock is. So our understanding is Brownstone has disappeared, and we don't know where he is. And there is no like enemy to fight except a clock here. Is that correct? That seems to be correct, although the Shroud can say he, <laughs> yeah, he I, he's he's half a cosm over. Yeah, I do. I share that information that something has forced him half a cosm over and locked him there. I don't know. But we didn't that. actually see anything happen except that he disappeared. That is correct. So far, that's all you saw. Okay. Well, I don't know how to bring, you know, Brownstone back from half a cosm over. So at this point, I'm going to do an active defense. All right. Which is convenient. What about you there, Shroud? I'm going to, can I roll reality to try to maybe join him at least and bring him back? Or uh, is there anything I can do with reality with my knowledge? You could. Yeah, you possibly could. Go ahead. Roll like a yeah. god. <laughs> I'm really good at roll like a god you are. Because <laughs> it's not quite a reality storm, you can penetrate it. Fifteen total. No, but you can you can tell it's it's a small space. He's in something about half the size of of the office. It's not I a very large I'm, thing he's in. As I look like I'm concentrating, I repeat that. Okay, so you could now you can actually sense it, so other people can try to breach it if they so desire. Anton. I think I'm going to try to do that act of defense to have my hammer out, looking around like, what's happening? Where is it coming from? Okay. Which is fortuitous because you and Anisha are attacked. Give I think it sort of six. looks like wisps of smoke. Remind me how active defense works. You Minimum roll. of plus one. Yeah, you roll a. Is a it bonus just roll a bonus? bonus? Yep. Just roll a bonus. Okay. Yeah, well, then... I rolled a heck of a bonus. <laughs> <laughs> nice. What'd you roll? I rolled a thirty-six, so I got an eleven on my active. Wow. 
Yeah. <laughs> Plus six was good. <laughs> I'm sorry, what were the approved actions? Oh, sorry. Uh, approved they actions are, defend, are defend and, and trick. So <laughs> you get a card. <laughs> you will. Well, I have to be successful, right? Well, well again, you're successful. In... The, the, the defend, you get a card if you are attacked and missed. If right, that's that what I mean. Defense. Yeah, right? and uh, yes, and he and uh, Anisha is attacked and missed. Nice, oh, excellent. So, so you do you get grab the awesome. I'll uh, actually cut this. What's this going to be? Hero, hero. Yeah. And what you? What you? What was your defense for uh, dodge? Oh, yeah. for dodge, uh, with my active defense. Yeah, <laughs> like. Uh, 23. Yeah. That, <laughs> so I'm, I'll go ahead. So, Lehman, what'd you get? I had a 15. Nice. Okay, so it missed you too. Awesome. Uh, you awesome. get a card as well. <laughs> okay. You get a card as well, which is Flurry. Goes to Lehman. Flurry. Okay. <laughs> okay. And I'm going to say that, the, said, right? that, that, Anisha, yeah, that Anisha's act of defense is so spectacular. That these things seem to form into sort of, you know, shadowy, bipedal creatures of some kind, you know, and they seem to be getting a little more as the round goes on. Uh, but I'm going to say that your defense was so good that counts as a maneuver because you, you, you absolutely curb stomped it with your defense. So I'm saying <laughs> you want that, want it to be stymied next round or vulnerable next round. I want it to be stymied, I think. All right. Let me go to the next round. Uh, so I actually still get an action on the first one, right? Oh, uh, yes, you do. Oh, I would I like to hard. take that. <laughs> yeah. So, like, I'm in another place and I got a monster with me in yes. the red. You said the environment around me, is it there or is it shrunk down or. What it I looks see? basically you've stepped in and everything outside of this little like five meter circle is smoky glass colored stuff. Cool. You can kind of make out you think those are your party. And you don't know what those other two things are. And you can see Linda still working on the contraption. Now, important question. Is the clock within this radius or outside of it? Within. Okay, so yeah, like I take the Slayer's gun up, I'm like, boy, you monster, you sure picked the wrong guy. <laughs> Regular bullet, and I'm kind of aim at him, and then shift it over and blast the clock. All right, go <laughs> ahead, sir. Not really expecting this to work, but I think it's a cool cinematic moment. Nine is minus one. So let's see here. Fire combat. I have hit an 11 against the clock. All right. What's the damage on your pistol? Uh, this is the Slayer's gun. It is 14. Ow. Okay. So the people outside the room see like <laughs> Linda backpedal and she's like, shoot. And <laughs> I the did. Clock, the crystal <laughs> in the clock just shatters. And you see one of the pendulum goes spinning across the room and embed itself in the wall and whoosh, the monster hunter reappears and they're just wrecked clock. <laughs> I, was, I was so close. <laughs> well, it will be bark. <laughs> well, we still got the shadowy or the, you do, you still have those two things. So we'll yeah. go to the next round. Don't forget to play a card in your pool, everybody, if you have. Oh, yeah. I got yeah, Master Plan out, baby. <laughs> Uh-oh. So the villains go first. And I'm stymied on Anisha. So you know what? That doesn't sound like any fun at all. Let's attack the Shroud. So 13 unarmed. Uh, yeah, I'm pretty positive that hits me. Yep, it does. Bye. Okay. Three. I do 15 damage. Yay. Ouch. I'm about to soak here. Let me just double check. That's a wound. So yeah, um, I am yeah going to go ahead and soak. All right. Try the other one who is stymied. 
Nah, uh, yeah, I'll I'll try to go after Anton. And it seems to look a little more, you know, a little more definite shape. And uh, it's it's just like a a Victorian, you know, aproned some sort of factory worker or something. And it strikes you, and it, I believe, misses. It has a nine. Yeah, that misses. Yeah, then I missed you. Okay. So, Greg, I got a 13, but I'm playing an action card to make it a 16 so I can prevent it since freaking okay. law of perseverance. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. yeah well, well dang law. <laughs> dang law of perseverance. So, hero's turn. And what uh, are the proved you- actions? Hmm? Proved actions are, def- are defend and trick again. Hmm. Wow. Hmm. Okay, well, I am going to, it might not work, but I'm going to use my mask and try to intimidate uh, one of the creatures, the one that is not stymied. Okay, probably the one that's attacking you, yeah. <laughs> so, yeah go ahead. Yeah, one attack me. Let's see. My mask flares up, showing its deepest, darkest fear. Oh, you got to be kidding me. Uh, okay, so, um, wait, uh, that's a four-way uh, contradiction, isn't it? Yes. Because I'm not. Yep. Okay. So I disconnect. <sighs> All right. So <laughs> you sort of, you sort of shoulders expand wide and kind of shrink back down. It's okay. only a by four if it's a both above the reality and above you. But it's yeah. a superpower, right? Which isn't mm-hmm. supported by the cosm. It's not supported by the cosm, but it's still but it's supported, supported by, by his cosm. Right? Oh, so right, you're right. Like yeah, 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 yeah. Okay. So that wouldn't be so. Saying. Okay. I just got. It was just a one case then, right? right yeah, I'm, I'm going to go and send a possibility, actually. Go ahead. All right. So let's see here. That last roll was a two. Uh, 23 this time is the total result on my intimidation. That's my <laughs> All right. It just stands there staring at you. And that point, his face comes into focus. And it's just like, Holy! Ah. So you you've scared a shade that takes that takes some skill. It's absolutely rooted to the spot. It's like evident it wants to flee and it cannot move. Uh, well, before Anton gets his heckles up here, I'm going to go ahead and go as well, and I'm going to actually do a real trick this time. Okay. So um, I'm going to grab like a, a piece of the glass from the clock right? And use a glint of light to try to distract, you know, the, the shade Got it. and, um, uh, so, you know, hopefully setting it up for Anton is the hope here. Okay. Odds are pretty good. So, so far, not so good, but I'm going to spend a possibility. Ooh. So 19 plus 6 is 25. So that's 8 on my trick, which is 18. So uh, two levels of what would you like, sir? Um, <laughs> yeah, I'm sorry. I will take, well, would would 21 push it further? Or ah, no, I'll leave it the, the way it is. So I'm going to make him, um, is this the one who's already stymied? Yeah, it's stymied, but it's already gone. So, you know. Oh, okay. Not, so the other yeah. one then. Um, I'll, then I'll do uh, very vulnerable. Okay, very vulnerable on Anton's one. So Anton, you've got this rather slightly less solid-looking shade in front of you. Looks like parts <laughs> of it are starting to wisp away. So ghost meet hammer. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's pretty good. Five, sixteen. Way more than enough since it's very well. Vulnerable. Actually, so that, yeah, a tw- twenty with the very vulnerable. I forgot to yeah. add those four points. Right, so, so twenty. Alrighty. So why don't you why don't you roll me a couple bonus dice there? Okay. I'm like all poised to give you a supporter card, but we don't need one. <laughs> <laughs> well, I haven't gone yet. <laughs> twenty six. Jeez. <sighs> roll it eight plus eighteen. <laughs> Wow. Well, the bad news is these things don't seem to accept wounds. Oh. The good news is that's plenty of shock to dispel. The shock. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> <laughs> All 
Go ahead. Just disappears. So you've got the one that's rooted to the spot in front of the shroud, trying to scream, but it just can't. And the uh, shroud, when you zapped it, did you make it stymied or vulnerable? Uh, very vulnerable. Oh, then I'd like, yeah, I think I'd like to take my action. No, I, I'll, I'll look at that thing. And uh, I mean, they're wispy. I'm going to take a chance that they're supernatural evil. And I'm going to switch to the holy water shell. And I'll go, you know, hey, monster, you know what that you and that clock have got in common now? You both got no face. Blam. <laughs> <laughs> All right. All right. I can live with this week in and week out. I'm just saying. <laughs> give, yourself, give yourself an additional plus one for the snarky comment. Let's yeah. go. Oh, I'm gonna play, yeah, if, after that comment, I'm going to play my Mark of Terror card because it was so bad. <laughs> so I'm going spend, to uh, spend a possibility. Oh, there we go. Because six wasn't great, but 23 is much better. Total. In total. So nope. eight, eight, 19 with the very vulnerable, that'll be a 23, 24. Yeah, okay. 25, sorry, because of the plus one you gave me for yeah, That's right, which, which <laughs> jumps it up. So go ahead and roll two dice. Awesome. Is it supernatural evil? Why, why yes. Oh, it, that's super it has cool. It's has its supernatural evil union card out. So Awesome. <laughs> So it's going to be 14, 17, 20, 22 damage. All right. This is cool. not how so. this is supposed to go. <laughs> oh, no. This, this is fine. This is, this is one way it can go. So, yes, they're, they are gone. They, are, they have been destroyed. And so you see Linda stands up. She's like, okay. I, th I, I think what is happening is those are some of the other things that his that the main thing is killed. So you got rid of two additional guardians. The clock's been destroyed, so they can't come out again for a while. So you bought yourself some time. But I'm pretty sure. Uh, well, yeah. You, if you want to destroy this thing, you have to play its game and reverse its actions which can be done if the clock is back and somebody has to survive its assault while the others rewind time, if you will. I'm not familiar with the process of rewinding time. Oh, it's really it's cool. Moving. It turns out there have been a couple <laughs> turns, turns out there, she goes to this discussion, but basically you, you get the gist of it is that a couple of prior cosms you know, conquered some things that can do what the monster hunter experience and sort of pick from a number of paths. But when they do that, they leave a trail back. So if you traverse their choice trail, which probably is some sort of supernatural process, you could eventually go back to the root thing that brought this clock here and destroy it for reals. Sounds like a job for some storm nights. <laughs> <laughs> so, all right. So we're about coming up at eight o'clock. You probably yeah. if you want to do a couple, if you want to do the girls' school, and that probably gives you enough information to take this thing in a fight. You want to I, continue I, that, or so that's up. It's it's up to you guys. Like I almost think like that's a great kind of cliffhanger. To leave it as yeah. like, that gave everybody the taste and the encounter and exactly what right. we wanted to do and kind of puts us exactly right time ways. But uh, like having a blast, I could go all night. But <laughs> yeah, I'm gonna blast too. But I, I agree with Daryl. I go, she's gonna uh, walk my dogs too. So <laughs> all right, that's, um, that's good. But yeah, basically, this is an example of an item from bleed, and the bleed is the hauntings from prior cosms. So. Eventually, you'll come up. It's a, a little bit like the nightmare mechanic. It, it doesn't have uh, as many layers to it, but you figure out how to kick it back, and then you'll get rid of it for real. Mm. Um, but uh, so the bleed is this thing doesn't exist in a Rorsch. It's pulled in from. It's called a one drop because whenever it kills, it reduces itself down to one drop of blood, 
which is the one you saw running up the, you know, the face of oh, the, the clock. The clock. Oh, okay. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. And so it's, it's, you know, hard to find and just sort of, you know, hop by hop by hop just keeps killing until, and, but, um, unwinding time is unnatural requires corruption tests. No. <laughs> oh. <laughs> yeah, that's not my job. <laughs> yeah. Once you get, so that's what that would be the step at the girls school is figuring out that oh they are trying to do something analogous for not so good reasons and uh adopting that methodology on the clock. So cool. Awesome. All right. Well thank you for running, Greg. Yeah, yeah. Well, thank you for Greg. playing. Thank you. That's a rare treat for me. I thank you, Greg. <laughs> yeah, and I, I, I have to fun. thank I have, I have to thank GM for letting me borrow Lady Yellowstone, and she's a character known as Lapis, who fell out of a helicopter in his campaign. So that counted <laughs> oh, as a yeah. counted as a so the bleed. Oh, so one of the things it does, yep, yeah, it allows the Gaunt Man to take the dying or dead from other realms and bring them in to th- converting them, transforming them to things he can control. So it's yeah, what, what I am going to try to use as a replacement for the waiting village. When the when the bleed happens, he can start taking creatures from other realms and making them his own. So nice. Very cool. There you go. All right. Well, without further uh, ado, uh, Grant's back. Uh, what what do you have, Daryl? If not, I can take us out, but it sounds like you're well, I was going to do the one last time. If you're watching and enjoying, or even if you're watching and not enjoying, don't forget to whisper Torgor Treat to uh, Eric. And if if Eric's not on anymore, to you know, just in, in the in the forum or to to Grant, so that you can get your download that we're sending out to everybody that you know came out to our Torgor Treat event. It's got five threat cards, the four new Gospog for Arorsh, and the Gaunt Man himself. These won't be available until the crowdfunding in January. So this is three months early. Come and get them. Whisper Torg Retreat, please, everyone. And thank you, everyone thank that came out. Yeah, yeah, to watch yeah, thank us. You. Yeah, thanks, everybody. And I'll All see I'll see a lot of you in the various Torg streams, you know, <laughs> and, and Tuesday you- and Thursday. Show your support in chat by giving up a cheer for our game master and these wonderful players and for the exciting gameplay that they delighted us with and to all of our panelists from the Arosh panel and the horror panel and all of you that participated in our trivia for the evening. Uh, And with that, uh, have a good night and happy Halloween. Happy Halloween. Bye.